because I'm a top like Gotta do. See, I don't know where your seating location is gonna be though. Karen McGlinchey one. Have you um? Nah, just just have a look on um. Is audio coming through? It's already in Google Chrome. It's already in Chrome. You just have to go to the first one. It's going through. Sorry? You only need to leave it on four or pump it up? No, just leave everything as is. Leave everything. Because it's a new day. No one's easy to use. Because you know how you... This is one of the tricks, right? That I learned from audio guys, right? Yeah. You know how you, like, every time an audio straight away... Um, it's a bit quiet or whatever, and you're like, sure, I bump it up. Yep. You're not supposed to do that because over time, ears gradually get used to, used hello, to the sound. Hello. And then once they get used to the hello, sound, hello. it gets quieter. Yeah. So that's why by hello, the end hello. of the day, you've already bumped it up so much that you're not going to have any more to bump up. You know what I mean? So that's why you kind of, yeah. Hello. Hello, hello. Ooh, this one's... Well, this one's good. Maybe it's a microphone, that's... Do you think? No. You want to swap it's them? All, all same system, everything same setup. I mean, like, the, that microphone is quieter than this microphone. Yeah, but they're not on, on the same decibels. And then that might be because you're closer to a speaker or something behind you. What's that noise coming from? And log in. If I remember this username correctly. What's the username? Enzo Camporeal. Oh, yeah, <gasps> probably right. Scary. Yeah. How good is that? Sorry, I'm just impressed myself. That's what you gotta start learning serial keys, man. Nah, no way. I gotta find my little bit of my button. You like what? The Windows key trick. I'm shoving it into the corner. Oh. No, don't worry about that because you're going to have to reconnect anyway. But it's easy to reconnect.
Make sure you do the right one because one of them is supposed to be on this way.
let's all stand. Good morning, Your Honour, Commissioner. Um, continue with the evidence of, uh, of Pastor Ainge this morning. Pastor Ainge is currently in the witness box. Thank you. Pastor Ainge, I'll just remind you that you are still bound by the information that you took yesterday. I wonder if uh, tab 49 in the policies and procedures bundle could come up at uh, page 7 or ringtail 0033. Excuse me, Mr Beckett, could we have your volume up just slightly, please? I could hear last night. But All right. Um, is, that, is that any better? Yes, thank you. Yes. So, Pastor Angel, I was taking you through the uh, May 1999 administration manual yesterday. That's correct. And um, I just wanted to continue with doing that and um, as to set out your understanding of the administration manual. Um, And so there's a further exhortation there at the first paragraph that says that uh, perverse activities, including those listed in Appendix 1, will always be considered as serious and must be dealt with according to this policy. So you understood that that applied to child sexual abuse? We're not on the correct page at this stage, I Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm right at the top there. Oh, sorry, yes. That top paragraph? Yes, certainly. Page. That includes child sexual abuse. All right. Um, then there's a note about exclusion from membership, and that applied to prolonged or perverse sexual misconduct. Um, and in the event of no acknowledgement of guilt, a person may be excluded from membership in the Assemblies of God Church. Do you see that? In an Assemblies of God Church. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, do I take it from that that um, there was automatic exclusion if there was no acknowledgement of guilt? No. No? Well, no? What was the position? What does that provision mean? Well, um, it needs to be understood that this policy was developed from the American Assemblies of God policy and was substantially changed to suit the Australian situation. Um, but within the American um, Assemblies of God, there was provision that the national executive could actually order a church to exclude someone from membership of a local church. And this um, particular reference is to membership of a local church, and that is to attend a church, effectively excommunication. And so it's a provision for that, but it's never been used in Australia, and it's never been tested as to the legality of it because all local churches are actually autonomous and determine their own membership. So what you're referring to, and I think you've referred to it elsewhere as well, that within the Assemblies of God and now the ACC, there's a degree of autonomy, local autonomy of each of those churches. That's right, isn't it? There's a large degree. You made reference to it in your opening comments, I believe. Indeed. And the, um, the role of the Assemblies of God and the ACC is to grant credentials and um, also, in appropriate cases, to withdraw those credentials. That's correct. That's right. And then the process is that um, a pastor of an Assemblies of God church who has had their credentials removed um, may still minister, but not in an Assemblies of God church that is affiliated with that organisation. Is that right? Again, I think you'd need to define minister um, in the sense of they would not be allowed to be a pastor of an Assemblies of God Church. Yeah. <laughs> but if you refer to ministry in the sense of um, praying for someone or even public prayer in the meeting, then it would be recommended to the local church that they not be allowed to do that. But we have no coercive power over the local church. All right. Uh, and nothing, nothing would stop that, uh, that person who had had their credential removed from... Um, going down the road and opening a new church not aligned with the Assemblies of God. That's correct. Yes. Yes. And that ha has that happened from time to time? On a few occasions, I believe, yes. All right. Um, let's go to dismissal from the ministry. You'll see it's on the page there. 
it says that in cases where sexual misconduct has been admitted or appears highly likely from the evidence, a minister may be dismissed from ministry. Do you see that? Yes. And this clause stands in contrast to... Sorry, I'll withdraw that. Um, all right, and if we go on further in that paragraph, all efforts should be made to restore such persons in their relationship with God, their church, their spouse and their family. Do you see that? Yes. Then it says, restoration to ministry may not be possible due to the extent or perversity of the sexual misconduct. Do you see that? That's correct, yes. So the rule appears to be there that restoration will not be possible due to, for example, perversity of sexual misconduct. I object to that. It's may not. It's discretionary as opposed to mandatory. All right. Well, look... Um, Pastor Ange, I want to suggest to you that the effect of this particular provision is that a person who has been, who has admitted sexual misconduct of a child may, is not to be restored to the ministry. I object to that. that. That's not an available reading from the use of the word may. Yes, we're not doing it from that. Well, I'll, I'll withdraw it and ask another question. <coughs> All right. Pastor Ange, what is your interpretation of that particular provision as to restoration to ministry of a person who has admitted to sexual misconduct with a child? We would have to turn to Section 2 of the screening process where paedophilia is specifically mentioned as a misconduct for which restoration of ministry is not permitted. All right. I'll just bring that up so for everybody's assistance. <laughs> Section 2 of this document at ringtail 36 or page 10 of that document, if that could come up, just the first two paragraphs. So we see in the second paragraph there that the... It says the National Conference has determined that no rehabilitation should be considered in the case of a minister who offends in the area of, and it includes, pedophilia. That's correct. Um, so there's no discretion in there, is there, in that particular phrase? No. So if we then return to <coughs> dismissal from the ministry... The rule there that restoration to ministry may not be possible due to the extent or perversity of the sexual misconduct is effectively referring to that provision in Section 2, which excludes, for example, child sexual abuse from restoration. I don't dispute that at all. Then if we go on to... Um, three, there's a process of rehabilitation for those who are um, to be rehabilitated. And uh, perhaps I should clarify this. Restoration and rehabilitation are used interchangeably. Yeah, that's correct. And there are a number of measures to be taken into account in that, in that program of rehabilitation. And if we go over the page, that includes... After one year, the minister may be permitted to minister the word in the local assembly during the second year. You That's see correct. that? Yes. And after an expiration of two years, the officers of, of state <coughs> may consider such for recommendation to restoration of his her ministerial certificate. Is it minister, the officers of state, is that a reference to the state executive or something else? Which number is that? F. Oh, sorry, it should, if we could go over the page, please. That would relate to the state executive, yes. Then, um, then there's a complaint procedure set out in the next part, and there are six points there. I'll just take you to the relevant parts of it. The start is that any complaint against a member of the ministry must be submitted in writing to the appropriate state officer and be signed by the complainant or their representative. 
Do you see that? Yes. And that's the commencement of the complaint procedure, isn't it? That's correct. All right. And the appropriate state officer would be, uh, would that be the, the president of the state executive or another state, state executive member? It could be any state executive member. And then the state is to provide a telephone number and name of an independent person who can be the first contact for a complainant. That's correct. Um, and that they then, effectively, that person, that independent person, liaises between the complainant and uh, the state executive. They would to be a support for that person. Yes. Um, and is it envisaged by this that they would involve, they would, in, they would provide some form of counselling, perhaps not themselves, but arrange or facilitate that counselling? No, I believe the counselling would come at the discretion of the state or national executive. But they would be there as a support person. All right. Um, and then, but in any event, in that next section, they, they become the conduit between <coughs> the complainant and the state officer. You see that in the yes. sec second last sentence? And, and then if we go to two, the, there's a, a further process. Um, first of all, at 2A, a full interview with the complainant, whereby the allegations of the complaint are completely documented. Do you see that? That's correct. So the process is that um, the state officer meets with the complainant and conducts a, a full interview, which seems to indicate an in, a, a detailed interview with the complainant of what exactly the allegations are. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. And it's a, and the intention here is that that's all written down. That is, the allegations are set out in writing. Yes. And then the second part is that the accused minister is interviewed by the state executive, or perhaps two delegated individuals from the state. Do you see that? Yes. So that's the normal process whereby those people would be um, would hear what the minister's response to the complaint has been. Is that right? That's correct. All right. Now, three, I think, applies if the minister denies the allegations. And I'll just jump ahead. And that um, records that a process of investigation by an investigating committee takes place. Is that right? That's correct. Um, all right. If we go to the next page, please, and to paragraph four, then there's a process of the investigating committee will then prepare a full report with recommendations for the appropriate state executive. Do you see that? Yes. Now, I see that there seems to be a gap in this procedure in the sense that if we go from two, where there's been an interview with the complainant and an interview with the, uh, the minister concerned, those have been documented. Am I right in saying that the next step would be that, the, um, that a report would be prepared for consideration by the state executive? I presume that that's the case. Um, and then five, if we go to five, the state executive will then make a recommendation to the national executive for determination. Is that the process? That's correct. All right. And so based on the report that the state executive had, had received in relation to the allegations and the response, they make a determination as to what recommendation to make to the national executive. That's correct, yes. And then the national executive can make, it, make the decision. Is that right? That is correct. All right. And then, finally, we see, if we go down that page to the heading publication of exclusion or dismissal, and then announcement of admission to a program of rehabilitation. So there seem to be two processes there. First of all, um, There's a process of publication if the minister has been dismissed. Is that right? There's the possibility of publication. Yes, well, it's at the discretion of the state executive. Is that right? That's correct, yes. 
um, but that all the other state executives in Australia are advised of the dismissal as a, as a matter of course. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So, in other words, there may be, there may be no publication except in that limited sense um, to even members of the Assemblies of God. That's correct. And then there's a different process for rehabilitation. Is that right? Yes. And it says the names of ministers admitted to a program of rehabilitation should not be made public. So as a general policy decision, um, I presume that means that both the allegation and the determination of that allegation are not made public. As long as they continue to adhere to the process of rehabilitation, that's correct. Right. And so it may be the case that if you follow that through, the minister may, after a period of rehabilitation of some two years, be restored to a full credential. Yes, that's correct. And it may never be known by the church at which they minister that the pastor had been the subject of, um, first of all, a finding of an allegation or of a process of rehabilitation. That's true. Now, what I'd like to do is, is then try and obtain a, an understanding of what happened at the meeting on the 22nd of December 1999, going through those various elements of the administration manual. Do you understand that? Yes, yeah, sure. All right. So by the time the matter came to the meeting of the National Executive uh, on the 22nd of December 1999, there doesn't appear to have been appointed an, an appropriate state officer to handle the complaint. Is that right? No, I think the whole the whole process of rehabilitation was um, effectively derailed when the complainant refused to have his name well, or his complaint dealt with. All right, we'll, we'll come to that. But I just want to go through the process that's set out, set out in the administration manual. At the very start... Was an, an appropriate state officer appointed to handle Mr AHA's complaint? No, the first that the national executive knew of this matter was at the meeting. And at that point, at that point, it was noted that there was no formal complaint and the... Um, complainant did not wish to be identified, so on that basis it was difficult to follow the process any further. Well, was there discussion of that process at all? Oh, totally. There was extensive discussion as to what should happen. All right, well, let's, let's wind back. So you're saying if there's no complaint in writing, then the... If there's no complaint in writing, then effectively the whole process under the administration manual is put to one side. I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying that at the meeting that we attended, with um, limited access to any advice, the decision that was arrived at was that with no complaint in writing, it was difficult to proceed, particularly since we couldn't appoint anyone to, uh, to contact the complainant because he refused to be identified. Well, that was on the basis of what um, Brian Houston had told you. Isn't that right? It was on the basis of what Brian Newsom told us. All right. Us, yes. Well, let's let's just wind back. Then you're aware, certainly today, you're aware of a letter <coughs> in uh, September, 16th of September, 1999, that was written by Barbara Taylor to um, Pastor McMartin, aren't you? I'm aware of it now. <coughs> I was not aware of it at the time of this meeting. Were you told? At, was it put to the meeting, or did somebody inform the meeting that such a letter? containing um, an allegation of child sexual abuse against Frank Houston by a named complainant had been provided to the State Executive Officer? To the best of my knowledge, no. All right. So after the 16th of September, we know that no State Officer was appointed to commence the complaint procedure under these guidelines. Is that right? That's correct. All right. Um, were you aware of whether an independent contact person 
or sorry, I withdraw that, whether an independent person had been appointed to liaise directly with AHA. I was not aware of that. Well, in fact, you weren't aware of AHA's name at all, were you? No. Um, did you ask whether an independent person had been appointed to liaise with the complainant at the meeting on the 22nd of December 1999? I don't recall whether that question was asked. All right. By you or by anybody else? By me or by anyone else. All right. Now, you say that the conduit for information about the allegation, so I'm just going to focus on the allegation sure. at the moment, was Brian Houston. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And um, I think Wayne Alcorn was aware of an allegation. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. But effectively, it was Brian Houston who communicated the allegation to the meeting. To my knowledge, Wayne Alcorn had no knowledge of the substance of the allegation. All right. And was any indication given to you that a full interview with the complainant had taken place prior to the meeting on the 22nd of December 1999? My understanding from that meeting was that the complainant didn't wish to be interviewed and didn't wish to have any contact with us. <coughs> and that came from Brian Houston? It came from Brian Houston, yes. <coughs> Was any step taken to um, provide contact through an independent person, namely somebody who wasn't related to the perpetrator? to establish that fact? No. Um, then, if, if I continue on with the administration manual, um, it says that the accused minister is interviewed by the state executive or at least two delegated individuals from the state. Um, was Frank Houston ever <laughs> interviewed by an accused minister, sorry, I withdraw that. Was Frank Houston ever interviewed before that, before the meeting on the 22nd of December 1999 by the state executive or delegates? No, instruction was given at that meeting in 1999 that he be interviewed. And that interview was to take place by Brian Houston doing so, is that correct? Um, well, that's what the minutes say. No, it states in the minutes that he placed be, be placed under the supervision of Ian Woods, a state superintendent of New South Wales. Yes, but that doesn't refer to any interview about the nature of the uh, uh, a nature of any admissions or at least any response to the allegations, does it? Well, that was certainly the intention, and it was what I communicated to Ian but Mr. Woods. Mr. Angel. The role of that gentleman, Mr. The role of Ian Woods was really as part of the rehabilitation process, wasn't it? As I say, the the whole process well, was distorted. Well, is that effect. right? Is that right? Well, on sorry, the... I object to that. The witness is entitled to answer it as he sees fit. Well, I'm not sure he was answering it. Well, he was. If I, could, if I could try to answer it, the fact is the restoration program was not in effect until an application had been made to enter the rehabilitation program, and so Ian Woods was effectively taking the steps of interviewing as, so that a decision could be made in relation to admitting to a process of restoration. Well, I'll just, I'll just bring up the minutes then. Tab three, tab three of the tender bundle could come up, please. If we just scroll, first of all, I'll, I'll raise this issue with you. Yesterday, you said that at the start of the meeting, Brian Houston was the chair, provided um, some introductory remarks about the, why the why the meeting had been held, and then stepped down. <coughs> That's correct. Um, and you'd agree that they, that's not reflected in the minutes that you took? That's correct. Because and, you, and you'd agree that it's standard procedure in terms of certainly large organisations such as the Assemblies of God 
to note in the minutes where a, a director member, the chair, has expressed a conflict of interest and stood down or left the meeting. We would certainly do that now. But you, um, but you didn't my, have that It was time. my failure that that wasn't done at the time. Now, if we go further down to paragraph four, and the first time that we see the mention of Ian Woods is under the agreement set out at paragraph four. Is that, that's right, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. And in it, it says at the second dot point, Frank Houston be invited to attend the AOG restoration program. Do you see that? I do see that. And that the next dot point is that he be placed under the supervision of Ian Woods. <coughs> do you see that? Yes, that's correct. So the minute records that the role of Ian Woods, and in fact the only role noted in the minutes, is that he is to supervise Frank Houston, presumably as part of the restoration program. Is that correct? Um, that, that is as it reads in the minutes. It's not as it was in effect. So you're saying you failed to write down or record in the minutes that Ian Woods was going to conduct a process of interviewing Frank Houston? That is correct. You will note, though, that at the beginning of my questioning yesterday, I mentioned that in relation to point four, um, sub point two, that it should read he'd be invited to apply for apply to enter the AOG restoration program. Because no one can enter a restoration program until they fulfil certain requirements. And those requirements were what we requested Ian Woods to fulfil in order for him to be considered for a restoration program. That's a different process to interviewing someone under the complaint procedure to determine what his response to allegations made by a complainant which had been recorded in writing, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not trying to justify myself, but the truth is this was a new policy. It was the first time that we'd actually acted on it. And it was done under duress in a meeting which was extremely um, emotional. Well, just on that point, uh, Pastor Angel, was the position, wasn't it, that certainly Brian Houston was the chair of the Assemblies of God at that stage? He was the national president of the Assemblies of God. Thank you. And um, he was, even at that stage, oh, a very prominent pastor within the Assemblies of God movement? That's correct. And that the Hillsong Church, even though it was still called, I think, Hills Christian Life Centre at that stage, was a very successful church? That's correct. With a growing con congregation? That's correct. With a presence on television? That's correct. And well known around Australia? That's correct. That he had the biggest congregation within, uh, uh, within the Assemblies of God churches at that stage? I, yes, I think so. Is it not the case that <clears throat> that, that pressure that you, uh, that you felt under was as a result of the allegations being made against a man such as Brian Houston with that national standing? I wasn't aware there were any allegations against Brian Houston. All right, I've phrased that wrong. As a result of allegations being made against the father of Brian Houston, who was a, a well-known, popular Assemblies of God pastor. The... The pressure, I believe, came as a result of the fact that Frank Houston was a, a well-known, respected and appreciated member of the Assemblies of God, and everyone was totally shocked and devastated at the things that he performed. And because, in fact, Frank Houston had been a founding member of uh, one, of the, one of the most well-established congregations within the Assemblies of God, namely at uh, Sydney Christian Life Centre? He'd been the founding member of that church, yes. Um, <clears throat> all right, now... There's a process whereby a report, I think you agreed that a report is prepared by the State Executive with recommendations to go up to the National Executive under the Administration Policy. Do you agree with that? Yes. 
Um, and you'd also agree that at the meeting on um, the 22nd of December that no written report was provided by Brian Houston or indeed by anybody else at that stage? No. And no recommendations were made by the State Executive to be considered by the National Executive, were they? At that stage, it hadn't been considered by the State Executive, to my understanding. And that is because Brian Houston had, had effectively taken all the steps that would usually be taken by the State Executive in that process. Is that right? No, I think it's because Brian Houston had been approached in relation to this matter and had determined to come immediately to the National Executive. Well, that's what uh, Pastor Houston says in his statement, is he received that information in late October of 1999, and we're talking about a meeting on the 22nd of December 1999. So you would accept that um, he had not determined to come immediately to the National Executive, if you accept those facts? I have no knowledge of timing whatsoever. But you accept that the word immediately, sorry, I'll withdraw that. You said Brian Houston had determined to come immediately to the National Executive. Is that what he said to the National Executive? Well, I don't recall. My, my comment of immediately could easily have been to come directly. I, there was no inference of timing in relation to that. You weren't aware that he had um, known of the allegations for at least two months? I wasn't aware of the length that he'd known of the allegations. All right. And two months would be a reasonable period in which to have members of the state executive appointed to deal with, first of all, an interview of the complainant and also <coughs> relevant interviews of uh, the minister complained against? Well, that would presumably have come through me if it was going to happen. Why would it have come through you? As the National Secretary. So do you agree with my timing about that? That is to say that two months is a reasonable period in which to undertake the process set out in the administration manual? It would be a, a convenient time or a reasonable time. All right. Now, as a result of... Sorry, I'll, I'll withdraw that. I'll go to the issue about rehabilitation. You'll see in the, uh, in the minutes, if, the one that's on the screen, if we go to paragraph four again, um, you'd agree that a process of restoration was agreed by the meeting that um, Frank Houston would be taken through, subject to application? Subject to application and approval. Um, I could note that um, it became clear that approval would never be granted because well, of the child molestation situation. Well, that's what I'm just about to ask you about. Given that the National Conference had determined and it set out in Section 2 of the Administration Manual never to rehabilitate a pedophile, why was it even considered at the National Committee meeting that that would occur? I wish I could answer that question. Is it not the case that effectively the rules, that particular one at Section 2, was abandoned or put to one side so that Frank Houston could be rehabilitated? Absolutely not. Well, you agree that it was a breach of the rules, or that is to say it didn't accord with the administration manual and that resolution of the National Conference? You agree with that, don't you? I agree that it was a breach of the rules, yes. And you agree that there was a process whereby he could apply for rehabilitation? I agree that the meeting agreed to him applying for rehabilitation. And that the process of that rehabilitation is set out in paragraph four? That's correct. And that a number of those matters, for example, the reference to refraining from public ministry for 12 months and also receive his credential at the expiration of at least two years, subject to recommendations, of course, were matters that were taken from the rehabilitation procedure in the administration manual. That's correct. So what is wrong with my proposition that 
the resolution at section two had been put to one side so that Frank Houston could be offered the possibility of rehabilitation. Look, I can only go from my knowledge of the meeting. I, from 15 years on, I acknowledge that the process that was followed was not totally correct in that um, it should have been obvious that he should, could never receive his credential. I'm aware of discussions that took place after this meeting where it was agreed that he could never qualify to be rehabilitated simply because it was an incident of child molestation. But I truthfully can't answer why this particular policy was followed, except to say that there was pressure in relation to the fact that it was a new policy that was perhaps not fully understood and the fact that there had been no, um, no formal complaint and the complainant refused to give his name. According to Brian Houston? Well, according to the evidence given to this commission. Well, but we're talking about what happened at uh, 22nd of December 1999 and you weren't in possession of that information as at that date, were you? No, that's right. All right, and the sole conduit for information about that issue was Brian Houston. Uh, Brian was totally trusted in that matter. And um, there, was, well, there was no discussion of the possibility of the complaint going forward but appropriate steps being taken to safeguard the identity of the complainant. There was a great deal of discussion in relation to where we would go and how we could deal with this situation. No, and what about that issue about the masking the identity of the complainant but pursuing the allegation against Frank Houston through the proper process in the administration manual? He did not wish to make a formal complaint. According to Brian Houston. Well, I object to this. I object to this. The, the evidence of AHA before this inquiry is that he did not wish a formal complaint within the non secular uh, organisations and the secular organisations. So it's unfair if there's some suggestion that Brian Houston was misrepresenting to the national executive of the AOG. Yes. And yes. that's, I mean, I've, I've sort of suffered it yes. most of the morning, but you know, there's time for a halt to it. I'm happy to, I'm happy to move on, Your Honour. Um, now, further, further steps were taken in, um, if we just scroll down the documents on the screen there, there was a further role for Brian Houston envisaged by the meeting, wasn't there? That he notified Frank Houston of the decision of the executive. All right, so again, we know that Brian Houston has been the primary con uh, conduit for information to the meeting, don't we? That's correct. And that after the meeting that um, Brian Houston is then given the task of notifying his father of the decision of the executive. That's correct. And that decision was effectively that he would be, he would continue to be suspended but that there would be a process of restoration adopted, subject so to application. Be to apply for yes. All right. And and then the second part of the role for Brian Houston was that he was to meet with the complainant, explain the process of discipline and restoration that had been followed. Is that right? That's correct. Um, so, do I take it then that? Um, the, the meeting was happy to provide Brian Houston with those tasks, notwithstanding that he was the father of the perpetrator. We weren't happy to do that, but we had no alternative since the um, Sorry, complainant I... had refused to give his name. We had no access to him, and the only access we had was through Brian Houston. Uh, I think I inadvertently said father of the perpetrator. I meant the son of the perpetrator. Yeah. Um, does your question, does your answer also apply to that? Exactly. 
Well, when you say you had no alternative, I mean, certainly there was a process in the administration manual for dealing with these sorts of matters. So, for example, through the appointment of an independent person. Is that yes. right? Um, are you saying that no consideration was given to appointing an independent person to deal with the complainant and to explain the process to him? To my, I don't have a recollection of that discussion. It could have happened, but I don't have a recollection of it. But in any event, no independent person was was, report, was appointed to deal with the complainant. You didn't consider at the meeting that um, Frank Hughes. Sorry, I withdraw that. You didn't consider at the meeting either you or other members there consider that. Um, Brian Houston had a conflict with respect to dealing with the complainant and the whole matter should have been taken out of his hands and passed to somebody who was independent of the process. With the benefit of hindsight that we agree that that should have been done. In fact, the administration manual is set up so that that very thing can take place, namely that an independent process can examine complaints such as this. Isn't that right? Well, yes, that's correct. Now, after this, after this meeting, I'm oh, sorry, I withdraw that. Um, was there any proposal at the meeting to report the matter to the police? There was discussion in relation to reporting the matter to the police. And what was the resolution of that discussion? I think I mentioned yesterday that there was discussion and um, point nine suggests that legal advice has been obtained as to our obligations in this matter. I was, don't have a recollection of where that legal advice came from. So let me put it to you this way. You and the meeting knew on the 22nd of December that a serious criminal offence had been admitted to by one of your pastors some 30 years ago. That's correct, isn't it? That's correct. You sought legal advice and, or through Brian Houston, you received advice that there was no legal obligation to report it to I the police. I didn't mention Brian Houston as giving that advice. Yeah. All right. As being the conduit for that advice. No, I'm not even suggesting that. All right. Who did the advice come from? I've already told you. I don't remember where the advice came from. All right. But you recall that there was advice discussion to that. I there. recall from reading the notes that there was discussion in relation to it. And the nature of the advice was that there was no legal obligation to go to the police. Was there any discussion of a moral obligation to take the matter to the police? There was discussion in relation to a moral obligation, but the main concern that we had was that the complainant did not wish to be identified, and it indicated that he didn't want to make a formal complaint. But to get to that stage, you were relying on allegations and communication provided to you by Brian Houston, who was compromised by his relationship to the perpetrator. I object to that. If, if it's implicit in that suggestion that the board was being misled about the unwillingness of AHA to mm. report the matter to the police, and that is unfair mm. because AHA says that is the fact. If, however, it's just a complaint about the lack of diligence, then that has some... Or the conflict. Yeah. Yes, well, it's the, it's the latter, not the former. Yes. I'm glad we clarified that. <clears throat> All right, so Mr. Uh, Pastor Ainge, it was the situation, wasn't that? Um, notwithstanding that you believed Brian Houston and that he may have been acting as far as you knew in good faith, it was still the position that he had a conflict of interest with respect to um, the particular allegation. Yes. And to assure yourself and the other members of the National Committee that 
Um, the issue of whether the matter should go to the police had been properly discussed with the complainant really required an independent person to meet and discuss the matter with the complainant. Is that a question? Yes. Um, could you please repeat it? Yes. What was required, sorry, I withdraw that. So first of all, um, you'd accept that um, the meeting understood that Brian Houston had a conflict because the allegation was against his father. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, we agreed that it was a difficult situation from that perspective. Well, that he had a conflict because the allegation was against his father. I've already answered that question. Well, I'm, well I'm, I won't go and find it again, but do you agree with that or not? Yes. And that um, you were relying on what Brian Houston said to you about the complainant not wanting to go to the police. Is that correct? correct? And you hadn't provided... Sorry, I'll withdraw that. And you had not had the matter assessed by um, an independent person. That's correct. And you had not had an independent person appointed to deal with the complainant. That's correct. And on that basis, you determined that there was no need to refer the complaint to the police. That's correct. Now, after, after this meeting in um, December of 1999, we don't seem to have any further minutes of the National Executive until there was a further meeting in November of 2000. Is that right? Yes, that is correct, yes. And I wonder if um, Tender Mundle Tab 5 can come up, please. Now, before we, before we get to that, there are a number of steps that were taken in the December 1999 meeting that I want to suggest to you would require some form of additional um, report to the National Executive. Do you understand that, first of all? Um, yes. And you recall that uh, there, were a, uh, there was a further process by which Brian Houston would go back to, the, uh, to his father and explain the position, and also that he would take the matter up with the complainant. you understand that? That's correct. Um, was it envisaged that there would be a further report by Brian Houston or by anybody else who was involved in the matter about what was happening with that matter? I'm aware of telephone conversations in relation to it taking place. There was no formal report. And... Um, as far as the National Executive was concerned, had that brought that matter to a conclusion, that is, the resolution of the complainant's complaint? Um, no, it wasn't a conclusion. All right. What, what steps were left to continue? We were um, still waiting to determine if there was, would be a formal complaint following the, the conversation of Brian Houston with the complainant. We were still waiting for Frank Houston to actually apply, apply for um, admission to the restoration program, and that never came. And so there was actually no activity in relation to this matter um, prior to that meeting of the 22nd of November 2000. Uh, I just want to pick up the, what you've just said there about the about there being a process of formal um, complaint. If Go back to paragraph 8, and I'll just read it out so we don't have to go to it. It says it was agreed that B. Houston meet with the complainant and explain the process of discipline and restoration that has been followed. Do you see that? Yes. It doesn't seem to say 
it was agreed that Brian Houston go and ask the complainant whether he wants to make a formal complaint and engage with the administration manual, does it? No. Effectively, the, the national executive had met and had determined that there would be discipline, namely the suspension and rehabilitation. Isn't that the case? No. Suspension and the possibility of applying for rehabilitation. All right. But apart from that, there was no idea that the whole process would commence again through the, through the lodging of a formal complaint. No, that's right. Yeah. Effectively, the matter had been dealt with. It had effectively, yes. All right, then um, if we go back to Tender Bundle 5. So during this period between December 1999 and November 2000, do I take it that the person who was handling matters with Frank Houston was Brian Houston? No, Ian Woods. And what was Ian Wood's role? Immediately following the meeting in 1999, I spoke with Ian Woods in relation to talking with Frank. My belief is that Frank was actually attending Ian's church at that time because he wasn't attending the CLC church. And I spoke with him about the fact of Frank applying or what would be required for him to apply for uh, to enter the restoration program all right and ian was dealing with him counseling with him and working with him in relation to that um, something i should have asked before but i'll ask you now was there any discussion at the meeting on uh, 22nd of december 1999 or after that meeting about the payment of any money by um, Frank or Brian Houston to the complainant? Could you ask the question again, please? I didn't get the whole question there. Was there any discussion, first of all, at the meeting on the 22nd of December 1999 about <coughs> the payment of money by Frank or Brian Houston to the complainant? At the meeting in 1999, there was no discussion in relation to that. And you would have noted that if there was? Yes. Because of... Sorry, withdraw that. In the period between that meeting on the 22nd of December 1999 and the special executive meeting on the 22nd of November 2000, did you become aware that allegation, sorry, that payments had been made to the complainant by either of those men? I did become aware that Frank Houston had made a payment to him. When did you? And it would have been. I, I can't say when I became aware of it, but sometime subsequent to that meeting, and he would have been in a telephone conversation with Brian Houston or a face-to-face -face conversation with Brian Houston. All right. And what did you say about what were the arrangements made for the paying of money to...? I don't know details. The only thing that I know is that a payment had been made to him by Frank. And did you ask what the terms of that agreement were? I recall Brian saying that um, he was concerned that it not be considered to be hush money or that he'd not be um, in any way uh, caused to not go to the police. Pastor but Ainge, in preparation for today, have you read um, Brian Houston's statement to the Royal Commission? I have read portions of it, yes. You read the proportion about um, Brian Houston saying he was concerned that the, the money be taken or interpreted as being hush money? Yes. Um, and you've made no notation before today. Sorry, I withdraw that. You made no written notation of that concern or that payment um, in your work as National Secretary, did you? No. You haven't come up with that just today. Have Absolutely you? not. All right, so if we go on to the 22nd of November 2000, I understand that um, Brian Houston again raised the issue concerning his father and further allegations of, um, of abuse that had come forward to him. Is that right? I believe that he'd received a complaint from someone in New Zealand. Someone from New Zealand had contacted him. And... As before, 
Um, he was in the chair at the start of the meeting and then handed the meeting over to John Lewis to chair. Is that right? I can't say for sure whether he was in the chair at the start of the meeting or whether he immediately said for, for uh, John Lewis to take the chair. All right, we'll just scroll down and I'll just uh, confirm that. You'll see under introduction, it says, Brian Houston outlined the accusations that have been raised against Frank Houston in relation to inappropriate sexual behaviour with boys around 33 years ago. Do you see that? Yes. And that he'd met with a New Zealand man who'd outlined the event 33 years ago. That's right, isn't it? That's correct. That the complainant indicates that he has no desire to be a part of any action against Frank Houston, but is requesting a personal meeting and so forth. That's right, isn't yes. it? Yes. And that the New Zealand Executive of the Assemblies of God is investigating rumours of a further two to five people. That's right, isn't That's it? That's correct. And it's, according to the minutes at least, it says Brian Houston then handed the meeting to John Lewis for him to take the chair. I take your advice on that. I wasn't in my recollection, but I wasn't sure when the chair was All right. transferred. But the, the meeting, the minutes are incorrect in the sense that the chair was Brian Houston to begin with until he handed the meeting over to John Lewis. Is that right? I accept my failing on that. And... Then the process of, sorry, I'll, before we come to, to that, had you heard about these allegations from anybody prior to the meeting on the 22nd of November, November 2000? I am not absolutely certain. I know that I'd heard from no one in New Zealand or in Australia that I'm not certain whether Brian Houston had actually indicated when he was asking me to call the meeting that it related to further... I believe that he probably indicated it was in relation to further accusations against Frank. All right, but it hadn't been... So there wouldn't have been the shock that there was in the first meeting, certainly. And, um, but again, it seems to be the case that Brian Houston is the one who was receiving those allegations. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, and that he had the most prominent role, if you like, in dealing with the allegations against his father up until this meeting on the 22nd of November? I wouldn't suggest he'd taken a prominent role. I'd just suggest that he'd been contacted in relation to it. Then, um, you, then he left, that is to say, Brian Houston left the, um, the meeting... And the matter continued under the, the chairmanship of Pastor Lewis, is that right? That's correct. And then a number of decisions were made then about how to handle the matter further, is that right? Yes, that's right. The main one of them seems to be that at paragraph F, which is on the second page there, it's noted that it was agreed on the basis of current information he should never have his credential reissued and he will never be allowed to preach again. Do you see that? That's correct. And then the process was to be um, that uh, Robert Ferguson, somebody from the state executive, is that right? No, that was a mistake in your initial Thank you. Where, thank you. Um, Robert Ferguson was never a part of the state executive. OK, I, I apologise. That's OK. What was his position in 2000? He was an associate pastor at Christian Life Centre, Sydney, and so worked closely with Frank. It probably should be noted that by this stage Frank was suffering fairly seriously with dementia and uh, we were wanting to have someone who was close to him to, to have dealings with him. Um, and um, he was to confront him with the accusations and ascertain whether he admitted them. That's correct, but that in fact didn't happen. Um, we'll come to that in a moment, but the and also you and Pastor Lewis were tasked with uh, going to New Zealand to ascertain what the nature of those allegations were against Frank Houston. That is correct. 
within very few days we were in New Zealand. I'm not sure the exact timing, but it was a, a very short time we flew to New Zealand. Now, there is a note about restoration here. That um, care and restoration be placed in the hands of the local church and that Frank and his wife be offered counselling. And it says, note, in this instance... So if we just scroll down, please, to paragraph four. In this instance, restoration does not relate to restoration to ministry. It was agreed by the executive that restoration to ministry will not be possible if any of the accusations prove substantive. That's correct. Do you think you meant by that, rather than substantive, substantiated? Um, I'm happy with substantiated. All right, then you travelled to New Zealand, I understand, and with uh, Pastor Ainge and met with the New Zealand executive, is that right? With Pastor Lewis. Sorry? <coughs> and um, you, provided, you ultimately provided a report to the national executive, um, and if Tender Bundle 7 could come up. And just briefly, if we go through that, um, if we scroll down to that paragraph that's at the bottom of the screen. So the New Zealand executive told you that there were a number of allegations of improper dealing with boys about 30 years ago with respect to Frank Houston, that's right? That's correct. Six, a total of six specific allegations. <coughs> yes. Is that right? Um, and it says that um, those allegations were all, all of improper touching of genitals. That's correct. And you say that the New Zealand executive believe that the allegations are substantial and they have no reason to doubt them. Do you see that? Again, substantiated would be correct. In other words, that there is sufficient evidence to... Or, sorry, I withdraw that... There, the New Zealand executive come to the decision that there was sufficient evidence um, to justify those allegations. To confirm that the allegations were true. Thank you. Um, and then you reported, that as you and Pastor Lewis reported, that his credential had been withdrawn and the new decision of the executive that his credential would never be reissued. That's correct. And then, then it said that um, that at least 50 pastors in New Zealand were aware of the allegations um, against Frank Houston. Is that right? That was the information given to us by the New Zealand executive. All right. And I think those... Am I right in saying that those allegations had been around for about three years by the time you came to meet with them in November of 2000? Is that in my statement? Oh, I'm asking you now. I think it may be in your statement. If it's not in my statement, I'm not aware of how long the allegations have been around. All right. Yeah, it's paragraph 30. You say in paragraph 30 of your, of your statement, I'll just read it out, it doesn't need to come up on the screen. Upon meeting with the New Zealand AOG executive, they confirmed that the rumours regarding Frank Houston had been circulating in the last three years. These rumours had never been communicated to the National Executive of the AOGA. That's correct, yes. All right. So had you heard any of these allegations about nothing at all, no. Frank Houston? No, nothing. And nothing had been communicated to you prior to this executive meeting? Nothing had been communicated to me, either personally or as the National Secretary of the ACC, AOG. And then there was an agreement, if we go back to the bottom of that page, it was agreed that a statement does need to be prepared for sharing individually with people who have heard of the allegations. That's right, isn't it? Yes, that's right. And you ultimately developed a, a joint statement. That's correct. And uh, I'll just take you to that joint statement. Mm -hmm. It's at uh, Tender Bundle 9, and then we'll come back to the rest of these minutes. Um, 
Uh, and we see there that both national executives have uh, agreed, or at least you drafted it for them to agree, um, in the following terms about Frank Houston. Is that right? That's correct. And you drafted this with Pastor Lewis. That's correct. And the description of the allegation is that uh, a claim of a serious moral failure against Frank Houston. That's right, isn't That's it? That's correct, yes. Um, and that Frank has admitted to the failure with great remorse. Do you see that? Yes. Why did you not mention the nature of the complaint in this draft statement? I've asked myself that question. Uh, my, I don't have a total recollection of it, but um, I think there was a, a concern that um, we wanted to use terms that were not too evocative of the situation. And why was that? Again, I, I can't be absolutely... I can't be certain in relation to it, but... Um, well, it would have been humiliating to Frank Houston, wouldn't it, if, uh, if it was published by the Assemblies of God that he'd be involved in child sexual abuse, wouldn't it? I think also it's worth noting... That well, is that we, right? Is that right or not? Well, that is correct, yes. It's also worth noting that the Assemblies of God does not function as a as a court and to actually mention something that's illegal or, uh, to affirm that something has been done that is illegal um, could have exposed us to um, legal action from him if he determined that no actual legal action has taken place. But you hadn't taken any steps to have that matter resolved by it being processed through the criminal courts, had you? No, we hadn't. And just returning to the minutes then, after you returned from New Zealand, um, there was a meeting between you, Pastor Lewis, Robert Ferguson and uh, Frank Houston and his wife that you've uh, included in your report. That's right, isn't it? And his doctor too. And his doctor too. And um, the allegations from New Zealand were put to him. That's correct. And three of three of the allegations... Sorry, I withdraw that. Um, two specific allegations were not put to him because the complainants did not want their identity revealed. Is that right? That's correct. Um, three of the complaints he said he could not um, remember. That's correct. But he did not deny them. That's right. And you say in his report that he said he had a continuing problem during that period of time. That's correct. Did you take that to... Did you understand by that phrase that he had a problem with sexual abuse of children during that time? Yes. Um, and then he was put... this an allegation from... It's referred to as the fourth person... Um, and he confessed that an improper incident had taken place. Is that right? It could be moved up the page in relation to... Sorry. That no, sorry, down. It'll be the next page. Yes, that is correct. And then it was explained to him the uh, the effect of the decision of the national executive that his credential would be withdrawn on the basis of that admission. Yes. Um, and then he said he has now retired. He was noticeably frail and um, obviously suffering with dementia by this time. Mm -hmm. That was it. But he hadn't, he hadn't withdrawn from ministry, had he, um, until the December 1999 meeting? No, to my knowledge, he was ministering up until that time. Um, so do I take it... Which was it, 12 months previous, of course. Is it reasonable to assume that he, he mentioned this issue of retirement on the basis of his credential having been 
withdrawn by the National Executive. I think the basis on which he was saying was, you can do what you like to me because I'm not going to be preaching anyway. I'm finished. There was a, a sense of um, finality about it. If we go ahead to tab Tinder Bundle. Eleven. Let's see, that's a meeting from. Sorry, I draw that. That's you will see. Tinder Bundle Eleven is a letter from Pastor John Lewis um, to Pastor Brian Houston, but also addressed to all ordained and probationary ministers of the Assemblies of God in Australia. That's correct. You see that? And in it, you'd agree that, that this was the first official notification by the Assemblies of God of the allegations against Frank Houston. That's correct. And in it, we see that um, the second page that Brian suspended his father's credential in line with our policy and immediately contacted the national executive. Yes. Um, again, that word, that word immediately was what you understood the position to be, wasn't it? That's correct. And then there's an excerpt in italics there that begins the national executives of the Assemblies of God in Australia and New Zealand have had the sad responsibility of investigating claims of a serious moral failure against Frank Houston. That's right, isn't it? That was a statement that was prepared in conjunction with the New Zealand executive. So Pastor Lewis was adopting, was using that statement that you and he had agreed and putting it into a meeting, uh, into a letter to all ordained and probationary ministers. Correct, yes. And then in the second last paragraph... You say that you have deliberately chosen to restrict this letter to our ordained and probationary ministers. That's right. And that, um, so I apologise, I said you say that is the letter says, or Pastor Lewis has said that, mm -hmm. and that he goes on to say, we cannot see any reason for this to be announced to your church or further afield. Do you see that? That's correct. So do I take it that... Up until December of 2001, some two years after the matter had gone to the uh, national executive, no public, no publication had been made of the nature of the allegations or the steps taken by the national executive to discipline Frank Houston. Information would have been given to each state executive. When? As was required. Um, immediately the decisions were made. All right. When you... As far as yes. um, going to our ministers was concerned, this was the first publication, yes. And um, there was no public notification, as far as you were aware, by the Assemblies of God prior to this letter of, the t of 2001? No. Pastor, do you appreciate that um, the publication of such allegations, particularly of allegations of child sexual abuse, may assist with other victims coming forward to express what has happened to them? I appreciate that. Do you think you understood that in the period 1999 to 2001? Probably not. Do you consider whether there might be some other people out there who may have been abused by Frank Houston, who may have wished to come forward? Certainly the question would have been in our mind, but I don't recall it being discussed. There wasn't. It's reasonable to say there wasn't a proactive approach of asking people to come forward to have no. complaints to deal with. No. Um, 
We now know that there's a, a process within the Assemblies of God by, where, by which um, a person um, enters into an agreement with a local church where they've been found to have been um, a pedophile or a sexual offender of one sort or another. Are you aware of those policies generally, at least? Um, yes, I am aware of those policies in relation to child protection policy. Well, child protection policy, but the presence of sexual offenders in um, Assemblies of God or ACC churches. I believe it's a part of the child protection policy, but I'm not certain about that. We, we have a, a policy, I think, dated 2009, which sets out that procedure, and I'm not going to ask you about that, but you're aware that it um, came in at about 2009? Yes. That was at the end of my time, or towards the end of my time as National Secretary. I don't recall the details of it, but... We've been developing policies continuously from the time of 1999 through to now. And um, do I take it, I'll, I'll just ask you simply, that no, no um, agreement was entered into along, along those lines generally with Frank Houston about his presence in an Assemblies of God church after his credential had been removed? That would be the responsibility of the local church, and I'm not aware of what was done in the local church that he was attending. On the Sunshine... Uh, on the... Um, um, not the Sunshine Coast, the... Uh, North side. This is an issue that con concerns North side. I'll just be very brief. Yes, uh, commissioners. My name is Woods. I appear with Mr. Bird on behalf of uh, North Side Christian College and North Side Christian Church. Um, <coughs> essentially, the hearing's broken into three parts. We yes. were intending to appear for our part, but there's obviously some crossover with Pastor Ranger's evidence, so we make our appearance now. Thank you, and I confirm that leave has been previously granted. Um, so this is a, this is a matter of about insurance. Now, um, I'll try to summarise the evidence briefly, but in any event, uh, civil proceedings were commenced in Victoria in the nature of personal injuries proceedings with respect to sexual abuse by a former teacher at Northside Christian College in 2001. You're aware of that issue? <coughs> Yes. And um, Northside Christian College assessed the, the position as to their, their degree of financial exposure to that litigation um, and particularly the degree to which they had insurance coverage um, for each of those civil claims. You, under, you understand that? Yes. 
and I, I want you to assume that they determined that the insurance coverage that they had um, was incomplete because um, molestation cover, cover had lapsed in about 1987. Can you assume that for me? Um, yes, yes, I saw, I've seen the evidence. All right. And um, it's correct in saying that in, from the 1980s and certainly afterwards, there was an organisation called um, Assemblies of God Insurance Services. That's correct. And that later changed its name to Australian Christian <coughs> Services. It became Assemblies of God Financial Services and later Australian Christian Services. Thank you. And one of the roles that it um, fulfilled was to broker insurance for const constituent or affiliated churches of the Assemblies of God. Is that right? That's correct. And that included public liability insurance. That's correct. Um, during during the litigation, uh, during the litigation that ensued as a result of the abuse by Mr. Sanderlands, the uh, Northside Christian Centre, I think it was, approached the Assemblies of God at the national level to seek, first of all, involvement in the mediation. Do you recall that? Uh, yes, I do. And the uh, Assemblies of God decided not to do that. That's correct. And why was that? There was... Um, the Assemblies of God had not been... Well, let me start from the beginning. The Assemblies of God is an unincorporated fellowship consisting of churches. It's a fellowship of churches. It is not a fellowship that involves schools in any way. And so there was a distinction drawn between the church and the school. Um, the Northside Church, uh, I must say that I wasn't elected to the National Executive until 1995, and so I don't have full knowledge of what happened prior to 1995. But the information that I've been given is that the church did not in any way contact the National Executive through the whole process of the, the discipline of the teacher. And um, the, you know, the whole process had not involved us and it seemed to us that they only wanted to talk to us at the point where they wanted money. Um, the other issue is that the Assemblies of God effectively has no assets in that it is simply a fellowship of churches and the churches hold their own assets and so we, we didn't have a, there's a sense for some people that we're a bottomless pool that has lots of money. The reality is that the assets were extremely limited. And um, the other reason is that the AOG Financial Services was not formed until 1990-something, and um, we weren't responsible for the insurance prior to that. Well, was there some um, arrangement in place between the, the Assemblies of God um, at the national level or perhaps at the state level in Victoria which assisted affiliate churches such as Northside Christian Centre with public liability insurance? They obtained their public liability insurance from the insurance company at that time. You mentioned the name of it. I can't actually remember the name of the first company. Uh, EIG ANSVAR, I think, is the one, or just ANSVAR is how we see it in the documents. But uh, that's the insurer. What I want to ask... Well, no, ask. sorry, the name of the broker. Could you give that, that to me again? I thought it was Assemblies of God Insurance Services. Is that not correct? You say Assemblies that... of God Insurance Services. Were they operating um, in the 1980s? They were operating in the 1980s. It was not... Um, if I could say, I was elected to the National Executive in 1995 and one of the first things that I was involved in was to try to determine or to determine the fact that in fact it was never owned by the Assemblies of God. The person who founded that um, set up maintained ownership of it and the Assemblies of God had no ownership until we took it over post 
1995. All right. So when, uh, sorry, I withdraw that. So a, a representation was made by the lawyers for assemblies of, uh, sorry, by the lawyers from Northside Christian Centre Incorporated that there had been a slippage, if I can call it that, of molestation coverage in 1987. You re recall that, receiving that letter? I recall receiving the letter, yes. Right. Did you accept um, that there was some responsibility in the Assemblies of God to remedy that apparent omission in coverage for a school such as Northside? No, the Assemblies of God never provided any insurance cover. And the understanding of the executive was that they were not liable for it. But you'd accept that, first of all, that the Northside Christian Centre were looking to the Assemblies of God insurance services for its assistance and advice on public liability insurance in or about 1986-1987? I accept that without any knowledge of it. Um, and are you saying that by the time this approach was made to you, and I think it was in 2001, um, that the position of the national executive was that any error or negligence by Assemblies of God insurance services was not to be sheet at home, if you like, to the Assemblies of God. That's correct. <clears throat> yes, those are my questions. Thank you. I know the time. Time, to, time to take a mid-morning break, so and we'll return after the mid-morning break and it will be at that point. Mr. Um, Pastor Ange, I think you've seen the process yes, already when, right. when other members of the bar table will be invited to ask you questions. Thank you. All stand.
Hold stand. So I have no further questions for uh, Pastor Ainge. There may be other council who do. Thank you, Mr. Beckett. Mr. Higgins. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Ainge, my name's Higgins. I'm appearing for Brian Houston and Hillsong Church. Mm. So I ask you some questions about the period of time <coughs> between. Late November '99, and the convening of the meeting on the 22nd of December '99 by the National Executive of the Assemblies of God. Do you understand the period yes. I'm asking? A um, series of questions were put to you about uh, the convening of that meeting. Can I just ask you, in relation to the convening of that meeting, are there any logistical difficulties which result in delay in having? in coordinating each of the members of that national executive to arrive at a mutually convenient date and time for them all to meet? Yes, I don't have any direct recollection in relation to that meeting, but consistently it was very difficult to get all of the national executive, most, of, in fact all of whom pastored significant churches, uh, to get them in the same room at the same time was always a logistical exercise. Um, I actually don't recall when I was contacted and how long it took to get the meeting together, but the fact that it happened on the 22nd of December is an indication that it was um, a very tight schedule that was being followed. Do you remember whether the decision to convene such a meeting had as part of its requirement the need for it to occur before the Christmas holidays? Yes. You do remember There's, that that was a feature? Um, yeah, there'd be no doubt in relation to that because a meeting on the 22nd of December is an incredibly inconvenient time to meet and it wouldn't have been done except for that urgency. And does, does the logistical difficulties that you've re spoken about, do they result in delay before such a meeting can occur? Normally meetings are planned two years in advance. The regular meetings are planned two years in advance and it's difficult to get everyone in the one place at that time. And so to call an emergency meeting often would involve a delay. Okay. Still dealing with the meeting, but <coughs> moving to a slightly different issue, the suggestion to you from council assisting was that you felt uh, pressure uh, at that meeting and you're... I you're object. The word pressure was one from the witness. He yes. said he felt pressure. Yes. That's fine. I'm Perhaps happy to be corrected on the that. the reason for the pressure. I'm happy to be corrected on that. Um, you indicated to council assisting that you felt pressure. Um, can I ask you, did that pressure arise not from the relationship between Brian Houston and his father, but from the, the fact that Frank Houston was as highly regarded in the church as he was? Yes. Um, still dealing with the meeting, the members of that national executive... At that time in 99, would you describe them as strong-willed? Um, I think anyone who was on the national executive was strong-willed and not easily led in any way. And are they, are they the type who would be overawed by Brian Houston? I don't think anyone there was overawed by Brian Houston. Perhaps I could suggest that it was one of the few places where, where Brian actually was in a position where people were prepared to challenge him and to make things difficult for him on occasions. If I could move to another issue, if I may, um, can I ask that uh, KA9 be brought up on the screen, please? It's from tab three. Mr Ainge. Just before the morning 
just before moving to the Victorian allegations, you had asked a series of questions about my council assisting in the context of, this is 9284, line 37 and following, um, in the context of the evolution of the development of a child protection policy between the period 99 and 2009. And in that context, you're asked a question about uh, the awareness How does the Assemblies of God monitor or ensure child protection? Do you remember that yes. suggestion? Um, by reference to KA9, do you see that there is a letter addressed to you of the 30th of January 2004 from the pastor of that church? That's correct. And um, by scrolling down, to the author of that letter, please. Did you understand Ian Zema to be the senior minister at uh, Central Coast <laughs> Coast Life Church? Ian Zerna. Zerna, thank yeah. you. <coughs> and you received that letter? I did receive the letter. And good KA10, put it up on the screen, please. By reference to that, KA10, you have there your letter of the 28th of April 2004 to Pastor Zerner in response to his letter of the 30th of January. Yes, that's correct. And is it fair to say that it was apparent to you from the letter of the 30th of January 2004 that the pastor, at, at, at least at that church, who had been the pastor for... Um, Frank Houston and his wife for the preceding 12 months was aware of the disciplinary process that Frank had undergone or that he was the subject of a disciplinary process. That's correct. Right. And that he was writing to you for guidance about the, the protection policies for the members of the community of that church where Frank was involved. Yes, in relation to protection policies, but I think he also had a desire to allow Frank to have a very limited involvement in ministry within the church. Can I suggest this, that what he was writing to you about was to say, well, look, whilst Frank doesn't perform any ministry ministerial activities, we just want to know what is the protocol if someone <laughs> asks him to provide some sort of blessing or something of that nature uh, in that church. That's correct. He specifically mentions um, to pray for someone at an altar, and that would have been part of the procedure of the church, that people would go forward and request for <coughs> people to pray for them on occasions, and he was asking if that was appropriate, and also whether it was appropriate for him to deliver a prophetic word. Just bear with me, please, Your Honour, Commissioner. Thank you. They're my questions. Thank you. Yes, well, I request to go last. Oh, yes, of course. No questions, Your Honour. No, thank you. <laughs> yes, I was thank, you. thank you, Mr Chowdhury. Yes. Uh, Mr Range, early in your evidence, you commented that the churches associated with the Assemblies of God back in 1999 and Australian Christian churches now are largely autonomous. That's correct. They uh, have control of their own affairs? Yes. 
they own their own property. That's correct. And day-to-day uh, -day decision making of how they run their church is left to them. Yes, that's right. And churches can leave affiliation, or start again, can withdraw their affiliation from Australian Christian churches any time they like. At any time, that's correct. All right. And the whole purpose of the <coughs> national executive of the Australian Christian churches now, and indeed back then in 99, <coughs> was largely credentialing of ministers associated with the movement. That's certainly a major factor of it. The other one was to provide leadership and to provide inspiration for the rest of the movement. In this regard, Assemblies of God in 1999 and Australian Christian churches now are different from, say, the Catholic Church or the Anglican Church, where there's a strict hierarchy of priests through bishops and ultimately an archbishop, correct? Yes, it's totally different. And in those churches, a diocese or archdiocese would own the property largely of parishes. That's correct. Thank you. And in respect of development of policies, such as a child protection policy, each state had uh, the right to develop its own policies and implement its own policies, correct? In relation to child protection, or in relation to many of the policies, yes. they, were, they were developed nationally. Yes. And um, each state was then told to implement them. In relation to child, child protection, the, um, my recollection is that New South Wales, but it may not have been New South Wales, felt that there was a need for a child protection policy and they developed or they presented one to the national executive for endorsement. And then it was realised that actually child protection policies are state specific yes. in that reporting is different in different states and the laws are different in each state. And so each state was then sent to um, adapt the policy to suit their own state. And that's why we have a separate child protection policy for each state. Thank you. Could the witness be shown, please, KA1? This is the first annexure to your statement, Mr Range. Uh, these are the minutes of that special executive meeting, 22 December 1999. If we can scroll down the page to item 7... That was a specific resolution of that meeting that Mr Lewis and Mr Alcorn meet with Mad Dog Morgan and inform him of the action that had been taken by the executive, correct? That's correct. Was, of course, it, it was Mad Dog Mudford. Yes. Yeah, that was the resolution, yes. Thank you. So it wasn't simply that everything was left to Mr Houston to take action on. Separate advice would be given to Mr Mudford. It was felt that it was important that he be approached, yes. Right. It was important that he be approached because uh, the executive had been advised that Mr Mudford had been in contact with the complainant? From our perspective, we understood that he was the major person who'd been in contact with the complainant, yes. All right. And were you aware at that meeting that Mr Mudford was wanting action taken against Frank Houston? Yes. Thank you. Now, if we look at item eight, the last sentence, that was a specific resolution of that executive? Yes. That uh, the complainant uh, be offered counselling if he desired it? That's correct. All right. And it was uh, uh, required of Mr Houston to make that offer? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Yes, I have nothing further. Thank you. Yes, nothing arises. Mr. Uh, Pastor Ange, just, um, just before I excuse you, just a couple of matters from, um, from us. Uh, you've, you've given evidence about the, um, the, the structure of the Assemblies of God, and in particular used the language of the um, various churches being affiliated under the umbrella of the Assemblies of God. That's right. Can you, um, for our assistance, 
explain what you understand that term to mean, the affiliation, and, and, and how it works operationally? Um, yes. Each church is separately incorporated, <coughs> and, um, or some are in unincorporated associations. The majority are incorporated as an entity, and the connection to the Assemblies of God is specifically required... Re referred to in the Constitution as a fellowship, and um, that means that the Church voluntarily cooperate in relation to evangelism and in relation to activities, conferences, uh, that sort of relationship. Um, they also agree to be subject to discipline processes so that the, there's a centralised approach to administering discipline and issuing credentials to ministers. But beyond that, each church is responsible for its own <coughs> um, administration, its own finances, it holds its own properties, it employs its own pastors. And whilst the Assemblies of God actually... Um, credentials pastors, the Assemblies of God in 1999, I can't speak for it now specifically, but in 1999, my belief was that the Assemblies of God employed seven people, uh, which included myself, a business manager, and um, someone doing accounts, and a couple of people in other administrative roles. And so the Assemblies of God has never employed a pastor of a church as such because each local church employs its pastor, control, you know, controls what its pastor does, and it's only in the issue of any sort of immoral action, whether it involves finances or sexual activity or a breach of the code of conduct that hasn't actually been referred to by the Commission, that the state and the national executive um, intervene to bring discipline in those situations. And the churches agree to that discipline. If they're not happy with the discipline, then they can agree to leave the Assemblies of God. There's no, there's no compulsion, compulsion to remain within the Assemblies of God. Has that happened or did that happen during your time as National Secretary? Um, perhaps once or twice. We had a lot more churches joining than leaving, certainly, but there, were, uh, there may have been a couple of... Certainly there are a number of churches that left, but in most cases I think they left because they wanted to take a different direction. I couldn't specifically refer to a church that left because it didn't want discipline, but I certainly couldn't say that it didn't happen. It could have happened. Thank you. In 2007, the... Uh, Assemblies of God changed its name. Yes, that's correct. Um, are you able to assist us with the rationale for that decision? The Assemblies of God is a, a young movement in the sense that it's... Um, the bulk of its congregation are young people, as distinct to many, many other churches. And there was a feeling amongst the national executive, that the term Assemblies of God um, conveyed uh, something that was older, that didn't seem to be contemporary, and there was a feeling that we could better communicate with the community and um, you know, with society in general with a name that specifically spoke about the fact that we are churches, we're Australian and we're Christian. And, so it was effectively a, a decision in relation to marketing, but it was a more effective name. I can't speak as to whether it's been successful or not, but it, that was the rationale behind it. Thank you. Just, um, just to return to one of the um, answers you gave in response to Mr Beckett's yes. series of questions to you that touched upon the issue of your understanding that um, Mr Ian Woods was going to um, conduct a process of interviewing um, Pastor Frank Houston. 
Um, yes. Do you remember? Yes, that's right. You know where I am. Uh, just one question for you about that. Did, did Mr Woods do that? Yes. Um, he was the state president in New South Wales and seemed to be the appropriate person to do it. Also, um, Frank Houston was attending his church at, at that time. And I think, and as I was looking at the document from Coast Life Church on the Central Coast, I think he was there probably for three years in that period. And um, it was felt appropriate for him to contact him. I distinctly remember having um, a number of telephone conferences telephone discussions with Ian Woods and asking him to spend time with, not only spend time with Frank and with Hazel and to, and to help them through what was a difficult time, but also to obtain a confession in a written form and to fill in a number of other documents that are a part of the restoration program to allow us to proceed uh, with dealing with the issue. And my recollection is that I was informed that whilst um, Frank Houston was receptive to talking and to being counselled, he had no interest in, in filling in any forms as far as he was concerned. His ministry was over, it was all finished. And does it follow from that he had no interest in signing any sort of confession? Yes. Can I just go to another area of your evidence now, just to clarify um, what uh, what you can recall? Um, you gave evidence about a telephone conversation with Pastor Brian Houston about money being paid to AHA. That's correct. Can you recall that? Um, you. Your answer to us indicated that you you uh, didn't recall the timing of that conversation, but can I ask you whether or not you you can place it in any particular year or as between these meetings? Oh yes, I'm sure that I can do that. Um, as I said before, I, I'm not certain whether it was a telephone conversation or a meeting in person. We met on a regular basis and we telephoned on a regular basis. But to the best of my knowledge, it would not have been between December the 22nd, 1999, and the end of January 1999, um, for the simple reason that Brian Houston regularly took holidays in that period of time and um, with the, the work that he was doing generally went away and was not available for that time. My guess would be that it would have been February or March, but it could have been April or May, but I, my, I would think it was probably February or March 2000 and certainly prior to the meeting at the end of 2000. And again, my, my, I'm not meaning to endeavour to quote your exact words, but um, our, my understanding of your evidence was that um, at least part of the discussion touched upon Father Brian Houston's, uh, Pastor Brian Houston's concern um, that the payment being discussed not, not be seen as hush money. I, I recollect that conversation, but I don't recollect the words that were said. All right. Do you recollect um, what Pastor Brian Houston told you about um, how he was going to guard against that possible perception? No, I don't. And I have to say that um, the term hush money is a term that I, I gleaned from reading the document that Pastor Houston put together. I'm not sure that those words were used, but I do recollect that he was concerned that it be seen as a payoff of some sort, and he wasn't happy for that to be the case. And um, are you able to say anything about your understanding of where that money was coming from? I had um, 
No, I don't think I was aware, except that my understanding was that it, it was private money, that it wasn't, it certainly wasn't a AOG money, and I, I, I was under the impression it was not Hillside money, but I don't recollect where it came from, that it came from a private source, and perhaps from Frank's, uh, Frank Houston's own resources. Anything arising out of that for anyone? No, thank you. No, nothing arising. Thank you, Pastor Ange. Thank you for your you. attendance and your otherwise excused. Thank you. Houston. <coughs> Pastor Houston, do you wish to take the oath or the affirmation? The oath, please. Could you raise the Bible in your right hand, please, and repeat after me, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. In this Royal Commission. In this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. If you just replace the Bible and take a seat. Seated. Just right here. Thank you. Thanks. Beckett, thank you. Pastor Houston, I wonder if you could state your full name for the Royal Commission, please. My full name is yes, Brian Charles Houston. Thank you. And um, you've given your address to the Royal Commission, I understand. My home address? Uh, no, but you've given, uh, I think it's probably your work address in uh, Borkham Hills to the Royal Commission. That's sure. And um, you've prepared a statement for the Royal Commission? Yes, I have. Dated the 28th of September 2014? Yes. Are there any changes you wish to make to that uh, statement? No. Uh, do you say it's true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. I tender the statement. 18009. <coughs> uh, Pastor, there's something that fell from the desk then. Yeah, I don't think, I think it's anything you. much. I think it's a microphone cover. Right. All right. And you're able to hear me, all right? I presume. I can hear you, yes. Yes. Uh, I noticed you took a folder into the witness box with you just for the transcript. What's uh, what's in that uh, folder? Uh, I've just got the three or four of the statements. All right. Um, I might uh, get you to hand that to uh, to Mr. Camperioli. Sure. Or... Okay. I was told by a colleague it would be quite okay to bring it up. Yeah. Oh, I see. All right. Um, um, if you. If you wish to refer to a document in one of your answers, sure. um, then uh, I'm happy to take you to it, depending sure. on what the issue is. Right. Now, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but uh, you grew up in New Zealand, is that correct? I did, yes. I lived there till I was 24. And um, your father was um, originally a Salvation Army officer? That's true. And he was ordained as an officer? Yes. And um, how long was he a Salvation Army officer for, do you know? I would say 12 years. I was three when, when they left the Salvation Army. Right, I see. And, um, and then he, he left the Salvation Army to establish his own church, is that right? He actually had a very bad, uh, two, a series of nervous breakdowns. So he was out of ministry, he was hospitalised. He was out of hospital, uh, sorry, he was out of ministry for uh, a period of time, maybe two years. And then he uh, began to attend a Pentecostal church in Auckland, New Zealand and uh, became an assistant pastor and ultimately became the pastor of that church. All right. And um, at some stage, I think by 1969, he'd uh, um, had he established himself at a church at Lower Hutt, just outside of Wellington? 69 or 59? Well, I'm not sure. I'll 1959. Go back. I, I was five. I think I was five yes. when we moved to Lower Hutt in New Zealand. So he moved from Auckland to Lower Hutt, is that yeah. right? Yes, and that would make it 1959. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, how long were you, was he a minister there for? I think 22 years. The other figure in my mind is 18 years, but it was about that period. All right. Um, and um, he rose to be, I'm not sure correct, um, correctly what his title was, but he, did he rise to become a senior member of the Assemblies of God in New Zealand? He, he was the superintendent time. of the Assemblies of God for 12 years. Yes, and the superintendent is the, it's like he, the he president. Had, he heads it up, yeah. Yes, all right. I think he was on the executive prior to that and then became the, the, the superintendent. Now, we know, of course, that he came to Australia um, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, is, that, is that correct to your memory as well? To live, you mean? No, to, uh, to visit, to preach. Yes, yes. He came consistently, my father, to Australia, mm -hmm. travelling and preaching all over Australia, different states. Yes. And uh, so... I would say, I'm, I'm guessing, but maybe four, five, six times a year he would come to Australia. All right. And sometimes you, as a, as a member of the family, would join him. Is that right? Only twice. All right. Um, <clears throat> then I have a note that he established the Sydney Christian Life Centre in, I think it's 1973. Yeah, am I wrong in that? Is it 1977. 77. July 1977. And that's... At that stage, he moved from Lower Hutt to Sydney, is that yes, right? Yes, he did. And that's when the Christian Life Centre was established? Yes. All right. Um, and then I think what happens next is that um, you and your wife, Bobby Houston... Yes. Um, ...establish... Sorry, I withdraw that. Did, did you join Sydney Christian Life Centre as a, as a pastor? We moved here in 1978... So, you know, roughly 12 months after my parents. And initially it was going to be a one-year working holiday. And we arrived and uh, have never gone back. So, yeah, I was uh, five years. Uh, initially we just attended the, the church in there. I was window cleaner. And then eventually became a, an, ass an assistant pastor. And from there, planted three different churches. The third one was what now is uh, Hillsong Church in Borkham Hills. I see. Um, I've noticed that the, that term planted seems to be used within Assemblies of God. Yes, church. pioneered, planted, but that's what it means. Yes, established. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And the idea that you grow a, a flock yes, or a exactly. congregation around that church, is, exactly. that, is that what that means? Yeah. Yes, well, thank you. Um, and... Then... Um, I think the next step in the in the chronology is that in uh, 1997 you rose to become appointed the national president of the Assemblies of God. Uh, what year, sorry? 1997. 97. Uh, that's probably right. Yes. Uh, in any event, you were certainly national it president. It is right. 1997. It is right. Yes. All right. Um, so, um, and then. In that year, that's 1999, there was uh, a merger of the Hidney, Sydney and Hills Christian Life Centres. Is, is that what Yes, yeah, so my father retired in um, May 1999 from senior pastor role. And the idea was he was going to be an itinerant. Uh, it may or may not be relevant, but at the time it seemed very rushed that he suddenly asked me if I would take on the church. And now, with hindsight, I think we know some of the reasons why that is. And uh, so May May of that year, 1999, I became the senior pastor of the city campus, what we now call the city campus, but then it was Sydney Christian Life Centre. And for a period of maybe 18 months to two years, we ran two very distinct churches uh, working in cooperation. And then we changed the name of Hillsong, oh, sorry, of Hills Christian Life Centre to Hillsong Church, and we merged Sydney CRC into Hillsong Church. So start, at the start of that process, you were the senior pastor at both Hills Christian Life Centre and, and at Sydney Christian Life Centre. For a period of something like 18 months, yes. Right. And then obviously it makes sense to merge the two. Yes, together. because they were working in cooperation. Initially, they were quite different uh, in style. My father and I were quite different in style and philosophically. So I guess that a lot of that 18 months was about really merging them um, yes. you know, in terms of DNA and culture. Yes. All right. Now, you said that the, um, the, the changeover, that is the, the resignation of your father from the position at the head of Sydney Christian Life Centre, 
came, um, I think you used the word, it seemed very rushed. Abrupt, yes. Yes. Um, what were you told as to the reasons for the resignation then? Well, he he had talked to me over the you know over a period. He's getting older, so he w was concerned about what would happen should something happen to him. So we had had conversations. We had we, we'd get together weekly for lunch, and we'd had conversations about whenever oh, Frank, uh, you know, is no longer pastor, that he would like to see me take on that role. He also, I think, um, had passed that on to the board of Sydney Christian Life Centre. So the board had adopted that. That should have anything ever happened to Frank that I would assume that role. So it's we talked about it, but yeah, he was still healthy in 1978, and I was not expecting it then. So when he did tell me, he says, I want you to do that, and I'm sort of saying, when? He's going, now. I want you to do it now. Yes. And so it was. It was, it was like, wow. Apart from that general handover, did he ever say to you something about the timing, why he wanted to... Um, retire from that position at that stage in 19... It would have been just around the idea that he was getting older now and he thought it was time. That's a progressive... You'd agree that that's a progressive conversation. I want to ask yes. you specifically about why it appeared rushed to you. Oh, I believe because he knew that things were coming to a head yes. with the issues that, are, that we're talking about here at the Commission. Did he, did he say anything to you in May of 1999 that indicated no, that there were these allegations? Nothing. Nothing. But I will say this. In that 10-month period between May, or May and uh, October, late October, November, when I found out, he was definitely stressed. And, of course, at the time I didn't know why. I thought, thought some of it was because it was really hard for him to let go of the church. Uh, something he'd, you know, been his lifelong thing, and it seemed like perhaps it was just that the reality of letting it go was a lot harder. But he definitely wasn't himself. All right. Uh, I'll just take you through some of the period before that. Now, we've been given inf information, first of all, that, um, that AHA, and you know who I mean by that. Yes. Yes. Um, AHA's mother spoke with Barbara Taylor in um, mid-1998 about the mm. allegations of child sexual abuse against your father. Yes. Um, and that um, she says that she didn't take the matter any further at that stage, um, yes. but that there was a meeting at her church, Emmanuel Christian, Family Christian Church in Plumpton, New South Wales, at which the mother told Kevin Mudford yes. that her son had been abused by your father. Yes. Yes. Um, were you told of that revelation, if I can term it that, by anybody in November of 1998? November 1998? 1998. It's Virtually 12 months before I heard one word about any suggestion that my father had anything hanging over him at all. All right. Now, we know that in um, sorry, just get the date specifically. We know that on the 4th of November 1998, there was a meeting between um, Kevin Mudford, Pastor Taylor and Pastor John McMartin, where they discussed some allegations um, that were made against a senior pastor. Mm -hmm. um, in November of 1998, were you told by Pastor McMartin or anybody else about allegations against a senior pastor, as opposed to your father, but those general allegations? I heard nothing whatsoever about this whole matter. All right. Whether it was about my father, Frank, or whether it was about anyone else, I was completely oblivious. Yes. Um, but obviously, if, if, if that matter, and I want you to cast your mind back to 1998, if an allegation against any senior pastor, particularly one prominent within the Assemblies of God, putting your father to one side for the moment, if that had come forward, even in an anonymised fashion, you would want to know about that, wouldn't you? I can't speak for 
Pastor McMartin, he's a good friend of mine, but I can say that if I had been told something like that, I would have been like a dog with a bone going after what we're talking about here. All right. Um, uh, and I understand you've, uh, you've either sat in the hearing room or you've heard the evidence that was given by Pastor Taylor yesterday. Yes, I did, right? yes. And you're aware now that um, she had been in telephone contact with your father yes. um, at about this time, and I'm talking about November through to February of 1999. Yeah. And did you receive any information up at that stage from your father or from anybody else no, about was, that contact? I was oblivious, completely oblivious. All right. Um, there was... Uh, I'll show you the, the document. It's uh, Barbara Taylor <coughs> and Nixia B. Um, have you had an opportunity to read this letter in your preparation I've today? seen it before, yes. Yes. All right. Um, and in or about February of 1999, did you see a copy of this letter to your father from Barbara Taylor? This, this letter here? Yes. At that time? Yes. No, no. When did you first see a copy of that letter? This letter here? Yes. To my memory, here at the Commission, or, you know, in the lead-up to the Commission. All right. Um, if an extra C could come up, please. <coughs> You'll see that that's a, um, a fax yes. addressed to dear Frank. Yes. And um, it's clear from this letter that uh, Barbara Taylor, Pastor Taylor, was attempting to make contact with Frank to line up um, a meeting between him and AHA. Yes. Yes. Did you see that at the time? No, I never saw any of these documents. And to be honest, the way I look at it all is Frank was dodging and weaving and uh, was a desperate man treading water. All right. Um, if it was faxed to him in 1999, is it likely that it was, was faxed through to Sydney Christian Life Centre? Yes. Uh, yes, it, and it has crossed my mind that perhaps someone else picked up that fax, but I know nothing about who or what that might have been. All right. Um, now, you're aware that... I guess you're aware now that in May of 1999 um, that Barbara Taylor wrote to um, Pastor McMartin again and updated him on the issue? I am, a, I am, a, yeah, I am aware that Barbara has produced a letter and I'm also aware that Pastor John McMartin is saying that he doesn't recall receiving that letter. All right. Did you receive a copy of the letter? No. In May of 1999? No. Were you told anything by Mr McMartin or, or, or by Pastor Taylor about... Um, about the matters that are the subject of that letter. No, and it's a, great, it's a matter of great frustration for me that, that I wasn't aware. Then I think that brings us up to September of 1999, and... Um, there is um, a further letter, if that can be brought up, please. It's um, a lecture F to Barbara Taylor's statement. Um, it must be the wrong reference then. I think it's... Uh, an lecture G, please. You'll see this is a letter from um, Pastor Barbara Taylor to John. It's, uh, she's affirmed that it's uh, to Pastor McMartin, dated the 16th of September 1999. Um, 
in or about that date, did you receive a copy of that particular letter? No. Um, and when was the first time that you saw that letter? This letter, let me think. Uh, to be honest, I think, again, in the lead-up to the Commission, when we received documentation. All right. Now, before we go to <coughs> late October 99, when you say you received the first um, set of allegations, did you have any contact with Pastor McMartin about um, your father? Prior to my conversation in... Yes. The, yes. So no, you, the, the answer's no, I didn't. All right. So between the 16th of September and late October, you did not have a conversation with Pastor McMartin concerning allegations against your father? No, certainly not on these issues, no. All right. And did you later have a conversation with Pastor McMartin where he indicated that he had received those allegations? We probably did. I... I, I I'm not clear on where, when, what that meeting was. Yes. But obviously, after the fact, we were probably communicating. And, Did you uh, say after the fact? Which well, after the fact, when I had found out that my father was a paedophile. Yes. You don't forget where you find out your father's a paedophile. So after that, uh, John and I were probably in contact. Yes. And um, what was the nature of that contact? Do you, um, did you meet? Did you have a telephone conversation? You know, I am unclear on that, and to be honest, on this one, I can't even remember uh, John being in the meeting with Barbara Taylor and myself, and that comes later. I, I'm sure he probably was there. The meeting was very much about Barbara and I, yes. and from what the documentation says, he convened the meeting. Yes. But, um, you know, I, 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 that's one thing I don't have sort of a memory on. Right. Do you recall any discussions with him about... Um, he was from the state executive, that's right. Isn't yes. It? And um, you heard that evidence earlier today about the administration manual and the role of the state executive. Yes. Um, did you have any conversation with him about him taking the matter over, that is, the response to the allegations yes. as per the administration manual? So my response you're talking about to I'm the I'm talking allegations. about a conversation between you and Pastor McMartin... Yes, yes. ..in the period between when you first yeah. knew of the allegations in October '99 and the meeting in December. I think it's highly likely a, a conversation happened. I don't actually remember specifics or whether there was, where there was, or right. anything. Yeah. But the evidence seems to be that we, that we had in the Royal Commission that um, he did not take um, a lead role in the investigation of the complaints against your father. Is that fair? I don't want to talk on his behalf. Yes. But you knew what the allegations were against your father? I heard the allegations from my general manager, George Agajanian, yes. and uh, I'll never forget the day. It was a devastating day. I, I had never heard anything before that. All right. Um, well, I'll go to that and I'll come back to that issue about the state executive in a moment. So the first, the first time that you received those allegations, I think you said, were, was at a meeting with George Agajanian? Yes. And his position was he was the business manager for Hillsong? Yes. And um, it was a face-to-face -face meeting between you and George? Yeah, we had a weekly meeting, and it was in that weekly meeting. Right. Now, what did he describe about the allegations? What did he say the allegations were? <sighs> My memory of the meeting went just like this. We actually talked about a few other things first because I think they would never have got talked about if we didn't have this, you know, put those things first. And then my, I can remember his words pretty well being, oh, there's one other thing I need to talk to you about. It's not about you, it's about your father. And I could tell by his face that this was not going to be good and my stomach dropped. And then he just went on and proceeded to tell me what's in the documentation and that is that... Uh, someone had rung just one of the pastors in our church and started to basically just blurt out all this stuff about Frank, my dad, and, and that pastor knew he was out of his depth, so passed um, the, the telephone uh, conversation, which was obviously Kevin Mudford, passed it on to George. So George had that conversation with him. All right. Um, so I, I know it, it, it appears to be of some pain to you 
Pastor, but I wonder if you can assist us by saying what exactly he said the nature of the abuse was and to whom. It was, it was very... He, I don't think he gave a name. I don't know that he even... that George even knew a name then. He may have, but I don't remember that. But it was very clear that he was talking about a minor. And the reason I remember is because it hit me, you know, in a 10-second period, in a wave, because I was, like, homosexual, you know, getting my head around that before my consciousness went to hold it a minute. We're not just talking about, you know, homosexual. We're talking about paedophilia. So... Yes. I can still remember it very clearly. So you understood it was sexual abuse? Absolutely. You understood it, it involved... It was an allegation made against your father? Absolutely. Um, you understood that um, it had occurred some years before? Is that right? And that meeting, I'm just trying to remember... Um, I would say yes. I would say yes. Yes. Um, I think that, you say 30 It did years. refer to something that happened a long time before. So about 30 years ago? Yes. All right. Um, and was it one instance... More than one instance. That George told me then? Yes. I don't know whether George knew, the, knew those what? details. Yeah. So it was put in a generalised form to you, just the fact of... It was the fact that this guy had called, had called the church, talked to a pastor, the pastor knew it was beyond him, passed it on up to George. George had a meeting with me and, uh, and told me that this complaint of sexual abuse, child sex abuse, had come in and... Uh, there may have been more detail. He may have known who the name was. I, I can't quite remember that. All right. Now, um, so what was the first step you, you took with respect to those allegations? What did you do next after you'd just been told that by Mr Agajanian? Cried. Went home and I was devastated, to be honest with you. I was totally devastated. All right. What did you What did you do next in terms of speaking with the complainant or speaking with your father or raising the matter with the state or the national executive? Yeah, I, I, well, as I've put in my statement, my father was away. I'm pretty sure he was going to be away for another three weeks. And so I determined that once he got back, I had no choice, absolutely no choice, but to confront him. It was something that I completely dreaded having to do. And during that time, I did talk to Mudford, uh, Kevin Mudford, on the phone. I can still remember I was standing beside my bed. And um, he, he wasn't overly emotive by then. He seemed to be um, happy that it had reached my ears finally, that it had got to me. He felt like, I think, to a degree, his 12 months of frustration had some level of easing. And uh, he told me a couple of details about that process, you know, the things that... the frustrations that they had had trying to get it to me. And uh, we had a general conversation. I asked him... I asked him specifics about what he'd been told by AHI, AHA's mother. And what did, what did he say? Uh, I think he just talked in broader terms about the fact that it was... You know, child molestation. All right. Um, so, did you were you told at that stage the location of of the the child abuse? I honestly can't remember. Um, when did you first come to know that the abuse had occurred in Sydney? Well, it's very possible that that did come out of George Agajanian's conversation with me. Uh, initially. Yes. Um, what about the... No, no, no. See, but no, when I talked to Mudford, I would have worked out... I knew who we were talking about by then because we... we, we so I found out who the mother was. I know the mother. So I knew exactly who was being talked about, the victim, the survivor. All right. So between that conversation with George and the conversation with Mudford... Yes. Uh, you know, I would, have, I would have worked out exactly who we were talking about. All right. Now, um, <coughs> at that stage, you certainly knew that there were the very serious allegations had been made against your father. Yes, I did. And that the allegations were likely to be criminal conduct of one Yes, I did. Or... I didn't have any doubt that it was criminal conduct. All right. 
Um, why didn't, at that stage, you go to the police and tell them what you've been told? On that day right there? Yes. Um, well, all of the information I was being given by uh, different people was that the man's 35, 36 years of age, and if he decides to go to the police, he, he can, or if anyone else decides to go to the police, that he can. If we were talking about someone... If this complaint was about someone who was under 18 then and there, I am absolutely certain we would have reported to the police. We would have made sure that's where it went. Rightly or wrongly, I genuinely believed that uh, I would be preempting the the uh, victim if I were to just call the police uh, at that point. All right. Um, I'll take you to some of that in a moment. Um, but you're saying that Mr Agajanian indicated that to you, are you? Indicated what, sorry? Indicated that... Um, sorry, I'll withdraw that. Um, had you received at that stage, either from Mr Agajanian or, by, or, from, Mr, or from Mr Mudford, any indication about AHA's... Uh, attitude to the matter being reported to the police? I think that it was made clear that he was um, extremely brittle, extremely angry that the information had come out, uh, extremely determined that he wanted his identity to not be revealed. He, want, he wanted to keep his anonymity. So I think I was aware of all those things. All right, so let's, let's just slow that down a bit because I know there are, there are a number of conversations that occur over this period between late October and December. Let's just start with that, the conversation with Mr Agajanian. Was there anything in that conversation that indicated what the position of AHA was to going to the police? Not that I remember. Was there anything in your conversation with Mr Mudford which indicated his attitude, that is, HA's attitude to going to the police? I think with Mr Mudford we did talk about, you know, his experiences with, uh, with AHA. I still intended after that to talk to AHA's mother as well and also to Barbara Taylor because her name had come into it, obviously. It happened at their church. And so I guess I was on a process of getting all the information, using the time while my father was away to try to get to the bottom of at least what we're talking about here. Right. Now, you were, you were the national president when the administration manual was adopted by National Conference in May of 1999. Yes, it was. And you'd agree that the complaint procedure in that manual deals with directly these sorts of allegations? Sure. Yes. At that point, when you'd received the allegations from Mr Agajanian, or indeed after you'd spoken to Mr Mudford, why didn't you engage that process? Which part of the process? The process by which the, it's referred to a state officer and then the state executive interview the complainant and then interview the... Uh, the I, I did make contact with the state superintendent. So the state superintendent, whose name... State president, actually, whose name is Ian Woods. Yes. Um, we did have a conversation. When did so you... I did fill him in on the fact that we're dealing with something very serious here. Yes. And I... From memory, he and I both agreed that the level of uh, Frank's prominence and the, you know, the serious nature, that it, it was probably a better thing to, to go straight to the, uh, to the National Executive because I think there's another document somewhere that does say that, uh, you know, for OMCs, that very serious, very serious uh, complaints are handled by the National Executive. Um, we'll come to that perhaps after lunch. Is that a suitable time? Yes. We'll take the lunch break, um, Pastor Houston, now and resume at two. Sure. All stand.
Alistair Houston. Um, before lunch, I was asking you about the, the initial uh, information that had been provided to you by Mr Agajania. Yes. In um, uh, late October 1990. Yes. Yes. Um, I take it that you didn't write, you didn't take any notes of what he had told you at that meeting? I think at the time that we, we he had notes and I had uh, notes. Unfortunately, 15 years on, we don't seem to have those notes. Don't, don't know where they are now? No idea. We searched high and low. All right. I um, never emailed in those days, so... In, um, <clears throat> at that meeting, um, I think the, the evidence that you gave that this morning was that, um, that certainly you'd never heard anything, any allegations against your father by that stage. Um, and that this was the first time that you'd been given any information that he may have been a pedophile. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so it, it came, I think you've indicated, completely out of, the, out of the blue to you? Completely. All right. And um, I take it then that um, you wanted to know, or at least you wanted... Sorry, I withdraw that. You wanted to know at that stage whether whether the allegations were true or not, didn't you? I knew deep down in my stomach, somehow deep down in my stomach, I knew it. I can't say why, but I feel like I didn't doubt the truth of them. There was some truth to it, is that what you said? Is that what you thought? I felt, I felt that um, this is not a good situation, that you know, it's not going to have a good ending. Um, and... You say that was on the basis of a gut feeling. Are you saying that there was no information prior to that in your father's behaviour that had led you to believe that uh, there may have been some concern about him abusing kids? You know, I'd never seen anything that looked like that. I'd never um, heard anything that looked like that. My father did tend to uh, spend time with young people and his ministry tend to... Uh, he tend to, tended to draw young people, you know, he had a, a, but... I didn't see anything untoward in any of that whatsoever. It just looked like normal, healthy uh, interest in, you know. <coughs> but something had led you to believe that you weren't... That it, sorry, I withdraw that. Something had led you to not be entirely surprised by the allegation that was provided to you by Mr. Hedgenian. <coughs> yeah, I can't say I wasn't entirely surprised. I was totally shocked and traumatised. It's just that somehow, we we'll call it instinct... I had a feeling that this is not just a malicious, you know. Isn't it natural to think that the next step was to establish whether the allegations <coughs> were true or not? Yes, I believe that's what I did. All right. And um, <clears throat> so do I take it that at that stage there was a question mark in your mind <coughs> about whether the allegations from Mr Mudford that had been conveyed to you through Mr Agajanian were true or not? I'm sorry, you have to repeat that question. All right. Um, there was a question mark, there was some doubt in your mind at that stage as to whether the allegations that have been conveyed to you by Mr Agajanian but were from Mr Mudford were true or not? Some doubt in my mind? Yes. Um, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't have any facts established, if that's what you mean. Yes. So, in that sense, yeah, I, I had yet to find out just what's right, what's not right. I just also, as I mentioned, deep down in my gut felt that uh, there's something more to this. All right, so you had an open mind. It could have gone either way in the sense that... Um... Yeah, if someone, could prove, if someone could prove to me that there was uh, no, you know, no, no substance to this, I would have been overjoyed, but I didn't feel like that was going to be coming. All right, um, so... I think the next thing you said, you spoke to Mr Mudford and your father was away at the time. He was overseas, I think, for a He was overseas for short. about approximately three weeks, maybe even slightly longer, from when I first found out in what we think was late October. It could possibly have been very early November, but it was right in that season. All right. And did you um, take in... in I'm just trying to establish the chronology in your mind yes. before you speak to your father on his return from overseas. Yes. Did you take any steps in that period to...? Mainly just talking to people 
here. Who did you talk to? I talked to uh, AHA, AHA's mother, AHI. Yes. Um, and that was, a, you know, she's a lovely lady. And You didn't speak to AHA, AHA himself, did you? Not at that point, no. Um, because everyone was telling me, even Mudford and um, the mother, and uh, by the time I got to talk to, to, uh, to Barbara Taylor, everyone was talking to me about his brittle condition. And uh, so, you know, there was a... There was a, a what's the right thing, what's the wrong thing to do? <clears throat> well, um, <clears throat> did you also speak to Ian Woods in that period before you spoke to Frank Houston? I think the answer is yes. It was either immediately before or immediately after. And what about what about Pastor process. McMartin? Well, this one, you know, John McMartin, I, I believe absolutely that we had conversations leading up to the meeting with uh, with um, Barbara Taylor, Pastor Barbara Taylor, uh, after I'd had the conversation with George Agajanian. I would think that probably I would have made sure that we had a conversation to hear what he was saying and what he had to say. I am more hazy about that, though, than other things. All right. So you're not sure about whether you spoke to Mr McMartin at that stage? I feel like we did. I feel like we did. I feel like we had the conversation around the lines of how come I didn't know earlier. But you're not sure? No, I can't say 100%. All right. Um, now, at that stage, you, you certainly understood that there was a process under the administration manual for this to occur, didn't you? Yes. And that complaints were dealt with in a particular way, yes. given to the state executive. Yes. And then a process was followed according to the administration manual. Yes. Yes. All right. Now, um, there's a provision in the Act for the, in the administration manual for, the, for matters to be escalated to the national executive. Yes. All right. And I think you said just before lunch that you had a conversation with Ian Woods. Yes. And the determination as a result of that conversation, <coughs> you took on responsibility as national president yes. to do so. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So did you understand what a conflict of interest was in October and November? Of Do I understand what a conflict of interest is? Did, you understand, did I understand then? Did you understand then? I think then I really felt on various levels. <laughs> we're talking about my father. We're talking about my grandchildren. We're talking about my role at Hillsong Church. Uh, which was only being formed, wasn't yet quite formed, um, had just taken on the city campus. And obviously, it's my role at, at National Prison. I, I felt like I had a responsibility to... to uh, the, the complaint had basically effectively came to me. And I, my, the responsibility I saw myself as having is addressing that, that time there. So, in other words, the fact that Frank was now a credentialed Australian Assemblies of God pastor... He was um, just a recently retired uh, Sydney Christian Life Centre pastor. So I just had the sense uh, that this is my job, this is my role, this is what I should be doing. Well, and it was obviously, just the conflict in that, the, the personal conflict in it, yes. was very real. All right. Well, I think you've indicated in that statement that there were, um, in fact three interests that you were representing. First of all, you as the son of your father. That's for the familial interest, that's is that right. right? That's right. You had an interest as as the, the, the leader of Hillsong Church. Yes. And that was an independently incorporated church. Which in those days was Hills CLC. It was Hills Christian Life Centre. Yes. Yes. Um, and also you had responsibility for the interests of the Assemblies of God, the, the greater organisation. Yes. Yes. So there are three interests there. Well, four, in the sense that I was also carrying a huge weight on behalf of my children, his grandchildren. Yes. Did you not understand that there was the potential or an actual conflict between those different interests at um, that time? At the time? Yes. No. Did you not understand that you had in your hands as the national president of the Assemblies of God, 
the interests of all its constituent churches yes. in the proper investigation and independent resolution of allegations of child sexual abuse? Did you that mention that again, sorry? Sure. Did you understand that you, in your position as National President of the Assemblies of God, had responsibility for protecting and ensuring the proper investigation and independent resolution of allegations of child sexual abuse? Yes. And at the same time, you were responsible for your children, I think you said, and their welfare? Yes. And also, as a son, you were responsible for the welfare of your father? Yes. And do you not see, sir, that there is a conflict between those two matters? That is to say, defending your father and defending... <coughs> uh, Can I answer that? Well, can I just finish the yeah. questions? And defending the proper process adopted for handling child sexual abuse matters by the Assemblies of God? Well, for a start, I don't feel I ever read a thought from now on that I can defend my father or my father's actions. So I don't feel like I was defending my father. Um, and uh, on the Assemblies of God side, I did feel like it was my role to inform others and start the processes and get other people involved in what needs to happen, what needs to... But, Pastor, do you not see that anybody outside of this process mm -hmm. would have immediately raised a red flag to say, this man is likely to be defending his father in a process of investigation of allegations of child sexual abuse? Uh, the life I live, people have all sorts of things to say. Yes. Uh, but isn't that the most likely presentation to the world if it was discovered? Given your sure relationship you to your, your father as well as the position of being yeah. the national president? Well, internally, definitely I was conflicted, so I don't doubt that at all. If you're talking about my own, you know, kind of grips emotionally with what my father did. But if you're talking about defending my father, I don't... What he did was undefendable. Um, and so I don't feel like that was a consideration at all. But it's not simply an issue about defending, is it? It's about achieving an outcome that, within the confines of an indefensible position, may have been positively re resolved. Isn't that why when we called the meeting... And on 22nd of December that I began the meeting, started chairing the meeting, and then stepped down and got someone else to chair the meeting? Yes, we'll come to, we'll come to that in due course. Uh, but at this stage, what I'm asking you about is whether the conflict of interest between you as the National President of Assemblies of God and you as your father's son, son caused you to consider that it was not appropriate that you investigate the matter further? No, that did not cross my mind. Right. And I felt... Um... So it appears to me, if I can summarise the position between when you first became aware of it in October 1999 yes. and December 1999, you did all you could yourself to resolve the issue. To, not to resolve the issue, to well, get to the bottom of the issue get the so that I can take it to the right people to have it resolved. Well, um, <clears throat> when you say taken to the right people, there was a process under the administration manual for the matter to be independently determined by the state or the national executive, wasn't there? Yes. But that's, isn't that why I called the national executive manual? Well, I'm talking about the period before then. What I'm saying is that... But I'm that... asking, sorry, just let me ask the question first. What I'm asking you is whether you took any steps to engage with that independent process under the administration manual prior to the meeting of December 1999. Yeah, I'm not quite sure where you're going. I do know that the, the, the victim, the survivor, he, he was absolutely not interested in anything that related to a formal church investigation. And I think there is always in me a sense of 
being sensitive to his wishes, not wanting to add to his already feeling disempowered by this coming out from his mother and others and racing ahead where he was at himself. But, sir, you'd appreciate, wouldn't you, that throughout this period, from the end of October through to December, the main person handling the matter for the Assemblies of God was you. Yes, trying to pull it in all the information right. so I could bring it to and the Assemblies of God. you were the son of the alleged perpetrator. Yes, exactly. How did you expect that to be received by the complainant? He, I was the only person he wanted to talk to. Well, um, he'd spoken to Barbara Taylor about the matter, hadn't he? Yes. So that's not entirely correct, is it? No, no, he'd spoken to Barbara Taylor. He'd already spoken to his he'd mother. He'd to already Kevin spoke... Mudford about it, hadn't well, he? Well, he was forced to talk to Kevin Mudford. But at least he'd spoken to Kevin he Mudford. He spoke to Kevin Mudford. All right. And he was starting to make noises that he wanted to speak to me. OK. And you say in your statement that you had one telephone conversation with him. Is that right? Yes. All right. Now, during that period, late October 99 to December, to the meeting in December of the National Executive, did you take any steps to appoint an independent person to liaise directly with him? No, because I don't believe he was open to that at all. All right. I wonder if you can assist me. It, seem, it appears... To, to me at least, on the evidence, that you, on the basis of protecting his confidentiality, controlled all communication between the Assemblies of God and him? To me, it was a moving target. It was a moving process. So we were on a journey towards what had to happen. And what had to happen is I had to... I suspended my father's credentials when I... Well, listen, it is, are you talking still prior to when I met up with my father? Well, no, I'm talking about the period between the end of October and um, the 22nd of December. Yes, so to me, it was a moving process, and that included um, finding out as much as I could from people while my father was away. My father got home on a Friday, from my memory. That weekend, he did preach, and it, and it possibly was in Canberra, but I can't be certain. Then, early in the next week, Monday or Tuesday, he came into my office... Uh, it was the worst meeting I ever had. I confronted him. He went extremely dry in the mouth and said, yes, these things did happen. Well, I'll just stop you there because that's the point I wanted to ask you about. Uh, what did he actually confess to? He, he confessed essentially to fondling genitals. All right. Of one or more children? No, we were only talking about that one and at that time, he told me that it was a one-off occasion. OK, so that term that we've seen elsewhere of one-off is likely to have come from that original confession that he made to you, is that right? That was his confession. OK. Did he also say to you something about... But I think... Sorry, sorry so let me ask the question. Yeah. Did he also say to you something along the lines of a, a naked boy walked across a room in front of him? I believe that is absolute nonsense. The first time I ever heard that was yesterday in, in the room. Right. I've never heard anything like that in my life. Did he, did he say something like that to you at, the, uh, at the, the occasion of his confession? I had never heard anything like that in my life. What did he, what did he say to you? He, he talked about the fact... He, he, he inferred there was no penetration. He talked about touching and, uh, and basic molestation. Uh, by molestation, you mean, is that the touching, touching of the genitals? Finding genitals. He didn't, I mean, it's been mentioned here that uh, my father <coughs> masturbated, yes. AHA, he didn't go that far. Um, but he, he, he didn't hide from what it was. All right. He yep. possibly minimised it, but he didn't hide from it. So, yes, yesterday you probably heard uh, Pastor Taylor talk about what she refers to in a note as a lesser incident. Um, yes. Casting your mind back, if you can, to that um, yes, I, I that meeting with her and with Mr McMartin. Yes. Um, are you able to assist us with what the lesser incident is that you said your father <coughs> had admitted to? I think I was just relating to her what my father had told me and that what my father had told me was 
what I've just told the room, the commission. And um, my father did say to me, so this is his belief, not mine, he did say to me as far as sexual abuse goes, it was on the lighter side. So I didn't see it that way. That's the way he told me. Uh, and I think that the conversation I had with Barbara was not so much what I thought, it was all about what my father had told me. All right. Now, that was important for her because obviously a full confession or at least a confession in terms of um, what the complainant was saying was important in terms of his ultimate rehabilitation in a, in sure, a, sort of, sure. in a theological sense at least. Sure. All right. Now, um, so at that stage, you'd had the conversation with your father. He had made certain admissions or he confessed to it, however yes. you want to term it. That's right. Did you think at that stage, this is the time that it needs to be referred to the police? Um, no. Why was that? Because he was 35, 36 years of age, and I genuinely believed that it was his prerogative to do that. And I most certainly never, ever did or have tried to suggest that nobody should go to the police. I knew for the five years my father was still alive, there was every possibility that he would be charged. Um, I'll just take you to that uh, the minute of the meeting. It's, um, I think it's an extra K to Barbara Taylor's statement. If you, I wonder if you could read through that, please. Sure. Omitted to ask you one, one more matter about um, the first meeting with you and your father, um, and that is, you said that there was no mention of a naked boy walking through a room. Yeah. Um, was there anything said about the little boy tempting Frank Houston during that? Meeting? Absolutely, one hundred percent not. I don't quite know why that was said, but it bears no resemblance whatsoever to any conversation I ever had with AHA. All right. Well, what about a conversation with um, with Frank Houston? So between the first time no, no. that you... Just uh, let me ask the question. First time that um, he confessed to you um, through to December of 1999, did he ever mention to you that the little boy had tempted him? Not at any point. There's no... My father, you know, he did some very evil things, but there is no way that he tried to blame the boy. He took it upon himself. Um, now, going to that uh, Anexia K, the one that's on the on the the screen, you'll see it. Um, we've covered point one, point two. Mentioned there of a one-off. I think it should be off rather yes. than of incident. But in any event. Um, you, you recall that there was a meeting that you had with Barbara Taylor, don't you? At the end of November? Yes. Yes. And that it was on or about the 28th of November? Yes. Yes. Um, and you can't recall whether John McMartin was there as well? Well, I believe he was there. I actually don't recall it. I just think that the, you know, he was there as a mediator, if he was there. Yes. The meeting was very much between me and Barbara, and that's the conversation I remember. Yes. And then at point three, um, it says, Brian said he and his family were in shock and that his father would be stood down from preaching. They would do it wisely. Do you, do you see that? Yeah, I can. 
do you um, do I take it from that that uh, you were considering standing him down, but had not stood him down at that stage in November? Um, when my father walked into my office that time, when he walked into my office, and we he initially confessed with me. He told me the nature of his uh, sin, and to be honest with you. No matter what any paperwork says, no matter whatever else happens, I knew he would never preach again from that moment. And to my knowledge, he never, ever did preach again from that moment. Um, so I'll ask you again, had the decision been... Sorry, I'll withdraw that. But um, the decision had not been made at that stage to stand him down from preaching, but it was likely. Is that what your evidence is? Well, I'm just trying to think on dates. It, it was became it was official in the 22nd of December meeting. However, I suspended him, if you remember, on the on the initial meeting I had with him. But I, I suspended him. We started the process, taking it to the national executive. But from a perspective of my responsibility, I saw my responsibility mainly as being the now, the present. And the present was Frank was an ordained Assemblies of God pastor. He was a former pastor of Sydney Christian Life Centre. He was now an itinerant pastor attached to Sydney Christian Life Centre. And I saw my main responsibility in terms of Frank as uh, addressing that. And in my mind, he would never preach again, and he never did. At paragraph five... Um Sorry, at paragraph four, Barbara Taylor gave evidence yesterday that she suggested at the meeting that AHA have counselling. Mm -hmm. um, and you agree that that was said at the at the meeting? Uh, I, I believe it because she's got it in her yes. well-kept diary, and, and I agree with it. And um, do I take it that um, no steps had been given, that no steps had been taken by the 28th of November to provide counselling to AHA? No, the meeting I had with him was on the telephone and... We'll come to that, but just, if you could just concentrate on this okay. that particular issue as to whether he'd been counselled prior to the 28th of November. Well, I have to keep on reminding myself of which dates were which, but uh, the answer to your question is, at that point... Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> point four... Yeah. whether he had received counselling prior to the 28th of November. Because of whether, his... whether AHA had received yes. counselling by yes. then. Um, no. All right, then. P point five. Then Barbara Taylor said there was a possibility that AHA would go to court. Yes. And that she had told AHA that I would not stand with him in court unless the church refused to deal with the matter. Do you see that? Yes. So you knew... By the 28th of November 1999, that mm -hmm. AHA was considering taking the matter to court. Yes. And that could include criminal proceedings. Yes. And it could include civil proceedings. Yes. And clearly, if there were criminal or civil proceedings in public, that that would, first of all, cause some humiliation to your father. Yep. And it would be embarrassing for you as... His son? Is that a question? Yes. I don't believe my embarrassment was the major priority whatsoever. No, no I'm just asking you yeah. whether it would have been embarrassing for you as the son of Frank Houston. Frank Houston to have it revealed publicly that there were allegations of child sexual abuse against him. I always knew that this would have to go public. That was never in doubt in my mind. Well, I'm just talking about this particular stage. Were you or were you not likely to have been embarrassed by that those matters being made public at that stage? Um, maybe yes, maybe no, but it wasn't a priority. It was in, in fact, it was embarrassing at any stage. It's embarrassing today, is it not? That's humiliating to me today that I've got to walk out there to cameras and so on about the fact that my father is a known serial paedophile. Yes. Now, you were concerned about what would happen with your father in criminal proceedings, weren't you? And you spoke to a barrister about that. I went uh, to see a lawyer, not a barrister, a lawyer. All right. Um, Who no, did you speak to? Pardon? Who did you speak to? Well, it was a family friend took me there. Um, the lawyer's name was... Uh, the lawyer's name was Graham. I can't remember his last name. And uh, I think he was at Mallison's. <clears throat> 
And yeah. we've been in contact with Mallisons, and they have no record of that meeting. All right. And uh, have you spoken to the lawyer concerned directly? Uh, I think we may have tried. I'm just looking at my associate. But uh, I think we may have tried, but uh, the answer is no. Um, in any event, one, one part of the advice was that um, it was likely that, that your father would be incarcerated for the crime. I didn't need a lawyer to tell me that. But I was well aware that if, this, if he was charged, there was every chance he would end up in prison. All right. Um, <coughs> were you also given advice about the, the likelihood of um, civil proceedings succeeding if um, AHA was to go ahead? Um, I, would, I, I can't remember, but it wouldn't surprise me. All right. Um, so you'd say that um, your father mentioned in a conversation with you in this period of time, so after the start of November and before the 22nd of December, that there was some discussion about the payment of an amount of money to Mr AHA. Yes. Was that in the first conversation that you had with your father about the matter? In my office, the initial one? Yes. No, it would have been in the pursuing period. In that meeting, what he did tell me was that uh, he had met, he told me, so it's his story, he had met AHA on Redfern Station and it paid him $2,000. All right. And um, you say in your statement at paragraph 32 that this was after his admissions. How long after those admissions was the conversation where he revealed to you that a payment had been made to... Uh, Mr. AHA. Can you show me the paper that we're talking about? Sure. Uh, paragraph 32 of your statement, if that could come up. It was part of that period. It was part of that conversation, basically. So I was, you know, we were talking, I was, I was, he was telling me the story, and that came out in that story. And um, your father's attitude to the payment was that um, he wanted to make such a payment? Look, yeah, I just see my father at that point as being a desperate man, trying to, trying to keep out of trouble. And do, do I take it that by, to... by the time he's, he is telling you this, that first of all, the, the payment at, at Redfern, as you say, he said yeah. to you, had been made? Yes, that's the impression I got. Yes, but the $10,000 had not been provided that to him. That was you. after I'd already confronted him that the $10,000 began to be talked about. Yes, all right. And... Um, now, AHA, we've said, we know, went to a meeting at Thornley McDonald's. Yes. Um, and um, he was accompanied by somebody else. Yes. Was that, was that uh, George Agajanian? No. Uh, do you know who it was? Yes. Who was it? It was a, a man called Nabi Sali, who's been a lifelong friend of my father's. All right. Was he a member of Hillsong Church? Yes, he's an elder at Hillsong Church. But he went along... Uh, first of all, by then my dad didn't drive, so someone had to go with him. I didn't want to be in it because of the conflict with Hillsong, and this was between Frank and AHA. And so he really went there, uh, if you like, in a pastoral, caring, friend, friendship manner, to drive him there, sit with him, help him through the process, and uh, just be his friend. Um, and uh, that's your father's friend, I, I take it? He's my friend too. But he definitely my father's friend. I'll just skip We've it. been friends, you know, the families have been friends for 30 years. That, uh, just the spelling of the surname, S-A-L-E-H, is yes, that correct? Yes, Thank you. Um, and you're aware of the, the evidence given by AHA about him being asked to um, sign an, uh, a soiled napkin? Yes. And um, it's the first time you've heard of that in these in the Royal Commission? Um, I believe there was a document that was signed. Yeah, well, I'll just ask you about the napkin, then we'll come to the document yeah. in a moment. Well, I, asked, I actually asked, prior to coming here, I asked Nabi Sali whether that could be true. And he said, well, yes, I think we did have something to eat. That was his answer. Um, 
he's a very sophisticated man. Whether he would just put a food stained napkin, I'm not sure, but he certainly did say we probably were sitting there having a burger. So it's possible it did take place. It's possible it took place. Yes, all right. Now you say that there was a there was a document. <coughs> Who showed you the document? That was a document that I'm not even sure quite where it came from. It was not a you know a formal document, but it definitely was on a A4 typed page, and it was two or three points. And I'm the only one who seems to think that document even existed. It would have been shown to me by my father. Is it? Well, let's just be let's try and be precise as to your memory about this document. Yes. So your father showed you the document. Yes, I or think Mr. so. Or it Mr. could possibly have been my brother or someone else around my father. Was it um, a, a, something entitled a, a deed of agreement or terms of settlement or something? I couldn't tell you whether I said that or not. Right. I don't know. You've seen deeds of agreement in the settling of legal proceedings before, yes. I presume. Yes. Usually they're some pages long. Yeah, this is very short. Three, three, three paragraphs, maybe three points. All right. Did you, did you receive any legal advice about that? Um, not that I recall. Were you aware of whether any legal advice had been given about the document to your father, to you or to Hillsong? Um, it's possible. And it is actually possible that it came out of that meeting I had with Malison. I can't say I remember that. And then, you know, I've talked to others, including my PA, who... Pretty well knows everything about what comes through my office, and I've talked to other people on the family side, and no one else even seems to remember that there was a document. All right. Now, what was on the document apart from the three, the three or so paragraphs? I think it was just along the lines of, you know, we agreed to this amount of money, and we agreed this amount of money is final. And just, I'll just stop you there. Were there yeah. was there anything else about typewritten? Sorry, I withdraw that. Were there any signatures on the document? Not then, because it was pre, pre the meeting. All right. So you don't know, because you weren't at the meeting, whether yes. that document was shown to Mr AHA. Did That's you? correct. All right. Now, Mr AHA says that he doesn't remember any such document. Yes. And we don't have a copy of the document. No. So we don't know. There's no evidence to... Sorry, I withdraw that. There's nothing, as far as you know, that indicates he was given a document to sign. No, definitely I can't. It, it, as far as I'm concerned, there was a document, but it doesn't seem to have gone anywhere. All right. Now, uh, you say you read the document? Yes, I did, for a very specific purpose. Well, yes, you're... S and what was, the, what, was the, what was that purpose? The purpose was because I wanted to be absolutely sure that it didn't look like this money was... Or, or, or that the, the, the terms, if you like, I want to be absolutely sure that the terms did not suggest that he could not go to the police and that it did not suggest that uh, this, doctor, this, this, doc, this document was all about keeping him quiet. And I, I'm very satisfied that those things weren't there because that's all I was looking for. But you, um, I think you said a moment ago that it um, indicated some form of finality. Is that right? Yes. And you knew that your father was seeking forgiveness from AHA. Yes. And that this was a process by which your father felt that, um, or at least expressed to you, that hopefully he would achieve both, both some forgiveness and some finality. With he, he didn't necessarily say that to me. Did you say something about forgiveness in the, in the document? Uh, he, look, he was looking for forgiveness. I, you know... I, I believe everything that AHA has said about Frank's feeble, you know, attempts for forgiveness and getting and going to God with his heart right. I, 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 he would he would say all of that. There's no doubt that he was beating himself up for the last five years of his life over the things he did, and he was a depressed man. Now, um, do I take it that um, this the payment of the ten thousand dollars? Was, uh, was that something that was facilitated by you? No, not at all. Did you, um, did you assist by writing a cheque out yourself? No, I did not. Did you um, recall receiving a f telephone call from Mr AHA seeking that $10,000? Well, this is an interesting one because the, the, the one conversation we did have, this is something that I, I had entirely forgotten. But when I read his statement... 
it reminded me, in actual fact, that did happen. It did happen that he was frustrated because he had been told he would be sent for $10,000 and it hadn't been sent. And so when I heard that, I was also very frustrated because I felt like the people helping my dad, which was family, um, had not followed through. And I'm thinking, that's the very last thing we would like to see happen here. And so did you speak to somebody to, to assure that the money would um, be transferred to Mr AHA? Yes, I spoke to the family. And uh, do I take it in terms of the timing of these things, that was before the meeting on the 22nd of December? Um, it's going to take me time to work this out, sorry. <coughs> I think, yeah. Uh, you know what, I, 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 just to give a direct answer, I would probably need a little bit more time to think it through. The timing of it, the sequence of it. All right. Well, perhaps we can go from the the meeting at Thornley McDonald's. Yes. Was the meeting at Thornley McDonald's prior to the meeting um, of the national executive just before Christmas. Uh, so it says just before Christmas, does it? The meeting. Yeah, the meeting was on the twenty second of December, nineteen. Oh, the, the meeting we had. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Yes. So was the meeting in Thornley? Was that before? The meeting of the National Executive on the 22nd of December 1999. At this very moment, I can't say one way or the other. All right. Um, prior to the meeting of the, of the National Executive, there had been some payments by Frank Houston to HAHA. Before I knew anything about this, back earlier in the year at Redfern Station? Um, at any stage prior to the meeting of the National Executive. Sorry, you'll have to reframe the question. All right. Okay. So, just in terms of the chronology, you meet with your father in yes. early November 1999. Yes. yes. Um, and we know that there's a national late, no, late November 1999. Late November 1999. He was away for three weeks. Oh. I feel like George and I, our meeting was, when we say late October, very late October, or maybe even early November. So, if you add three weeks to that, it would be oh. somewhere in the 21st of November. You just say early November in your, uh, in your statement. Yeah. All right, so you think it was later in November? I do. And certainly before that meeting with Barbara Taylor and... Yes, maybe Best immediately before, a few days before. All right, OK. So the meeting at Thornley McDonald's... Yes. Where was that in relation to the end of November and the meeting of the National Executive on the 22nd of December? I just can't answer your question at the moment because I, I've got a mental block, I just can't think. But it's if recent. I had a half an hour to go and think about it, I might be able to come back and tell you. But All right. Now, the, it is the case, though, that um, a payment at Redfern Station yes. had been made to AHA. According to Frank. According to your father. Yes. And you knew that pretty soon after you'd spoken to him. I think in the meeting. In the meeting. Yes. And when you say the meeting, the, it's the, the first confession. When he and I were in my office yes. together. All right. <laughs> now, when the meeting on the 22nd of December... Sorry, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, I just want to deal with those, the calls or the two telephone calls. Now, um, if we could please have an extra L brought up. And if you could just scroll to the bottom of that. All right. Um, I can take you to the whole document, sure. if you like, but you recall that this is a letter that um, Pastor Taylor wrote to you, dated the uh, 29th of November. OK. Do you remember receiving that letter? Yeah, I'm reading it. Perhaps you could scroll up so you have the entirety of the letter and uh, you can refresh your memory. Sure. Yep. And if we just scroll down...
And you'll see there there are three handwritten entries dated the 30th of November and the 1st of December and the 2nd of December. Yes. And you'll see that um, AHA was attempting to contact you. I, never, I was not aware of that at the time. All right. Um, and did you receive uh, any communication from Mr McMartin about um, AHA wanting to speak to you? No. Um, no that I remember. All right. By this stage, by the time you received this letter from Pastor Taylor, had you spoken to AHA at all? Um, I believe the date I talked to AHA was the 23rd of December. Is that based on the... Um, the note that Barbara Taylor's produced is a... Well, her note says 21st of December. Yes. I feel quite quite confident that it was immediately after, the day after, I'd had the meeting with the National Executive. That's certainly how it is in my mind. Are you saying that the first contact you had directly with AHA, after you knew, first came to know of the allegations, was after the national executive meeting? As far as I can recall. And you had no contact with him prior to that? No. I think there was some um, attempt, and maybe even both ways, but I think there were some attempts to, to, um, to connect, but I, it didn't happen. Now, you say that in that telephone call that AHA said, I don't want to go public, I don't want to go to the police, I don't want my identity public. Yes. Um, did you have any discussion with, did you suggest to AHA that there may have been a way in which to protect his identity and still be able to speak with the police? Look. I can't really remember that. I do remember that, um, that the tone of what we've heard here, that he was extremely brittle, that he uh, was adamant, that he did not want his name exposed, that he did not want uh, to be investigated by either the civil authorities or the church authorities was exactly what I heard in that conversation. So my... My um, actions from there, genuinely, I thought I was, I was uh, being sensitive to his wishes. All right. Well, I'll just take you to an extra M, which is um, a record of some notes prepared by Pastor Taylor. <coughs> and you'll see at point two, if you could just read that to yourself, sure. there's, there's an account of what... Pastor Taylor has said was a conversation she had with AHA yes. about your phone call. Yes. I've read it. Uh, first of all, do you, uh, do you think, do you accept that it's likely that there was a phone call between you and AHA on or prior to the 21st of December 1999? I believe that meeting happened on the 23rd of December. He, uh, you know, this is the, the same letter where notes to speak to John McMartin when I spoke to him. Yes. There's an uh, anomaly, even in the way she, she describes that, notes to speak to John McMartin when I spoke to him. So these are notes she's saying that she has prepared for when she speaks to him, but she also says when I spoke to him. So it's quite hard to know for me exactly whether this is pre the meeting or after the meeting. I... S I just think the date's two days out. I could be wrong, but that's, that's how I, I you see You don't it. have any contemporaneous record, any diary notice? No, I don't. When the phone call no, happened? All right. Um, and in it, she says that um, what AHA had told her was that you had been very defensive of your father. Yeah. Um, do you agree that you were defensive of your father during that conversation? I do not agree at all. Um, and that during that conversation you did not offer any counselling to him? I disagree. And you said to AHA that Frank Houston was not even in the AOG at that time? Oh, the, that's not what I said. Uh, it's not what I said. It's a derivative of what I said. What did you say? 
I think, and again, we all know it's 15 years ago. Could I take you through A, B, and C? Uh, or do you well, just want yes, to talk about go, C? Go on. Yes, go ahead. With A, B, and C? We'll start with A. With, with the defensiveness of my father, I think I was probably compassionate towards my father, but in terms of trying to defend anything he had done, that wasn't in my thought. It wasn't on my radar. It was indefensible what he did. And I don't feel like I've ever moved from understanding the moment he told me that this is a serious criminal matter and it's indefendable. Do you think it's likely that your compassionate response towards your father was interpreted as defensive by Archer? I think so, maybe. I think maybe that, that it is a, an interpretation. Well, let's go on to B. What... But my whole... My whole um, my whole intention in talking to him was about him. Um, counselling. What yeah. did you say to him about counselling in that telephone call? I did suggest that we have counselling because the Assemblies of God had, had offered to do counselling. And so who, who was going to arrange that? Well, I guess that the, the National Executive would have done it. I wouldn't have been doing that particularly. We would have had someone within the National Executive who would have arranged counselling, and I would say it would be, it would be independent counselling. What was the process that you envisaged? I mean, how was he going to accept such counselling? Who would he well, speak to about it? I, I would have been quite happy to work with him about the process and whether he'd be comfortable with one form of counselling or another or a particular counsellor. And uh, the people I work closely with, like Keith Ainge, would also have been involved because that was a, a minute of the national executive. Uh, so I did offer him counselling, and he was very clear. I don't, you know, I just want to move on. He, his everything about his persona was like, I, this is this is you know obviously hell. I don't want any of that. I don't want any interference. I just he said to me, I want you to believe me. It seemed to mean a lot to him that I personally, Frank's son, believed him, I and I guess now the leader of the church. He said. Um, he said, uh, I do not want this to become public. I do not want it to be out there. And uh, then the third thing he said was along the lines of, I just want to leave this whole horrible thing behind and get on with my life. All right, let's move on to the meeting of uh, Special Executive on the 22nd of December 1999. Sure. You know the meeting at Sydney Airport that I'm referring yes, to? Yes, yes. Um, and it was a meeting that you convened? Is that right? It's a meeting that I organised. Well, Keith pulled together, but that I asked for, yes. Now, at that stage, you were the person who had, <coughs> first of all, spoken to uh, your father about the allegations. Yes. And nobody else had spoken to him about those allegations, had they? Not me? at that point, no. Yes. Well, um, AHA had been speaking to him long before I was, and so had Barbara Taylor. All right. But officially, absolutely, I was the first. Certainly there was nobody from nobody else from the national executive who'd been meeting with him to uh, interview him about the allegations. No one knew. Yes, no one knew. All right. Um, now, we, we're told that Mr McMartin told uh, Mr Alcorn at some stage prior to that meeting. Are you aware of what that communication was? Yeah, that's not something I had actually remembered or that, or that I necessarily knew. Um, neither of them had told me that they'd had that meeting prior to, um, to the 22nd of December. I guess it all started coming out, you know, who had spoken to who and what had happened. Yes. But my understanding of that meeting now is that uh, Pastor Alcorn uh, told, jo told Pastor John... Uh, that he just needed to tell me. All right. So the meeting the meeting occurred, and um, we've heard from, as you probably heard, Pastor Ainge, who said that you commenced by chairing the meeting and reported on the allegations. Is that right? I told them the story. I burst into tears, sobbed. There was no way I could chair that meeting because I was a mess. Um, but you remained in the meeting for the entirety of it? I did. I think I was a passenger, but I was there. Um, when you were asked about details about, for example, the nature of the confession, you told those there about that? I did. I told them everything I knew, I think, in terms of the fondling, the, you know, the nature of it yes. at that level. I didn't tell a name. 
again because I thought I was looking after the best interests of AHA. And um, and um, you didn't inform them about uh, the payments that have been made to AHA? I'm still a little confused about exactly where the, what the date and where in the whole thing the payments happened. I, they were definitely happened. I was definitely aware of them. I thought they happened in a park. I didn't know they happened at McDonald's. I knew it was in Port Lee, but I but, thought it was in well, a park. Go back to your evidence from earlier today. You said that um, at the meeting, perhaps the first meeting with Frank Hewson, that he informed you that a payment of $2,000 had been yes. made. Yes, I was aware of that. AHA. So you knew by the 22nd of December that one payment of $2,000 had been made. Yeah, I would think I would have passed that on. Why didn't you pass that on to the special executive meeting? I think I probably did. Well, it doesn't appear in the minutes here. Uh, well, let's put it this way. I would have no reason not to. There was nothing to hide there. Well, one reason was that um, you didn't want the executive to know that um, an agreement had been reached with AHA to bring to finality his allegation. That $2,000 was never about finality, as far as I know. And I had, I, hearing now the other side of the story, that the meeting never, ever did happen, that could be true. I, I only know what my father told me. But there would be nothing about my persona. Over that money, there'd be nothing to hide when it came to the national executive, because it was Frank's money, it was Frank's problem, it was Frank and the victim together. So... You know, Pastor Ainge says that he was he received probably some information of a payment later in 2000, probably in a phone call. Did you hear that evidence this morning? Sorry? Did you hear the evidence th this morning from Pastor Ainge where he said... Well, he that, got a phone call from me. Well, he had a phone call with you... Yes. ..in which he said um, he was told of a payment being made to AHA. Yeah. Now, obviously, that was a relevant matter... For this meeting, wasn't it? No, that would be the, the ten thousand. That would be the ten thousand dollars. I'm presuming. Well, so you think the ten thousand dollars was made at some later stage? Yeah, the two thousand was on the railway station, where AHA mentioned uh, CM Frank's green Jag. Frank never had a Jaguar and never had a green car in Australia. But that's neither the neither the matter. Um, so they've obviously Excuse got two me, different just, sides just... of events that. Can I just clarify? An objection, uh, it's just a clarification. AHA never said that he sat in Frank's green car at uh, Redfern Station. His evidence is that that meeting didn't take place. Yes. Yeah, he, yeah, he said, he did say, excuse me, that, well, that there was, was there a green isn't a question. So the, I'll just, I'll clarify it in a, in a moment by asking you a question. Uh. So what you're saying about the railway station and the mention of the green jag... <coughs> um, I, what had Frank Hewson said to you about that? He'd said that there was a payment of $2,000 that was made to AHA at uh, Redfern. That's how I understood it. Now, AHA said in his evidence, evidence earlier this week that um, he received $2,000 into his account, yeah. but not at Redfern. And either of those is possible. Yes. But uh, it's likely, irrespective of the how it was done, he did receive a payment of $2,000. Yes and that you were aware of that fact about the time that your father revealed that he had abused AHA. Which would probably be about eight months after the, after the, the payment was made. What was eight months after the payment was well, made? Well, my understanding is that payment was sometime early in February 1999. And eight months after what point in time? So I'm saying that about eight months after that is when finally I found out and All confronted right. my father. I see. So by yes. November 1999, you yes. found out about it. Yes. All right. Um, and the payment to AHA was not revealed to the special executive on the 22nd of December 1999. Are you sure? Well, what I'm putting to you is that, first of all, Pastor Range says he doesn't recall it being revealed, and secondly, it's not recorded in the minutes. OK. I'm not so sure that it wasn't mentioned, but because uh, we've already heard it was an extensive conversation and they're relatively limited minutes. So I'm not so sure that it wasn't, but I can't say absolutely that it was. But I have absolutely no reason to hide it because it wasn't me, it wasn't my payment. 
And you say that there was a payment later of $10,000, or well, you're not, in fact, sure when the $10,000 was paid. That's the situation, isn't it? I, I think, honestly, if I just could re take some time, rationalise it all, I could come to a, a, a time a time frame when that was. All right. But I think it probably, probably was before the um, AOG meeting, the, AC, yeah, the AOG 22nd of December meeting. Right. But, uh, you know, I just... I just aren't sure enough to give you a black and white answer. Well, if that's the situation, if it's likely that you knew before the 22nd of December 1999, what were you hoping to achieve by not telling the special executive that such a payment had been made? Well, I'm not convinced I didn't tell them. Um, there's nothing after the 22nd of December 1999 which indicates some formal report to the National Executive which includes what payments were made. To be honest, the payment, had not, in this sense, had nothing to do with the National Executive because I was adamant that this was not about Hillsong, this was not about the Australian Assemblies of God. This payment was between Frank and AHA. Um, I'm just going to move on to another issue about that meeting. Now, we know, we know first of all, that the administration manual, as it stood in May 1999, prohibited the restoration of um, a pastor who had admitted pedophilia being restored to the position of pastor. Do you yeah. understand that? Sure. Yes. And that was the, the policy adopted by the National Conference? Yes. Um, and you also heard the evidence, no doubt, earlier today that it appears in the meeting of the 22nd of December that your father was offered restoration if he applied for it. You realise restoration in our movement is a two-sided thing. Restoration is relating to a person's relationship with God. It doesn't necessarily refer to a person being back in active ministry. And that's in the documentation. <sighs> Pastor Houston, I'll, ta I'll take you to the document, Tender Bundle 3, and you'll see at point four this, what the restoration was that was discussed at that meeting. If that could come up, please. Yeah, I understand. I, I, I know what it says. Now, Pastor Ainge agreed that this was the position. These, these were the determinations of the meeting on the 22nd of December. Sure. And you, you see at point four, if we could just scroll down to that. You see that the, there's reference there of the AOG restoration program. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And there's mention there of refraining from public ministry for 12 months mm -hmm. and that he not receive his credential until the New South Wales superintendent had recommended it. that after two years. Do you see after, that? After at least two years. So the restoration issue that was discussed at the special executive meeting was exactly about restoration to a full credential so that he could minister again, wasn't it? I'm not convinced. You're not convinced by these minutes? I'm not convinced that that restoration was purely talking about restoration to preaching ministers. That's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you is do you quibble with the fact that the restoration discussed at the meeting included restoration to a full credential so he could preach again? I've got two answers to this. I think that, you know, there's already a, if you like, a contradiction between point uh, four, he refrained from public ministry for 12 months. I have to confess I'm a little surprised to see that that was in the minutes uh, because it's totally opposed to certainly what my belief was about what should and would happen. Um, and then a little later on, it then talks about something else that seems to contradict he not receive his credential until the New South Wales Superintendent recommends to the National Executive at the expiration of at least two years. To me on this, the at least two years was relevant in the sense that it, just because it says that doesn't mean that after two years he was going to get his credential back. And uh, again, from the moment I first confronted my father, I knew as his overseeing pastor at Hillsong, he would never preach publicly again, and he never did. All right, but that's not what the minutes say. No, I agree. And it appears that the decision that was made 
was to engage your father in a restoration program, yes. notwithstanding that National Conference had prohibited pedophiles from being restored to full ministry. Right. Is that, do you agree with that? Yeah. yeah, I do. So it appears to have been a decision made by the Special Executive to step outside of the determined policy of the National Conference. Do you understand that? I understand what you're saying. All right. And one way in which to interpret this is that by you being in the meeting of the Special Executive on the 22nd of December, you were, one way or another, able to influence the decision so that your father could return to ministry after a period of restoration. I object to that. Um, if the question is, by your presence you intended that, then I, I would have no objection. If the question, as it's currently phrased, is, by your presence you had that effect upon the other people, then my submission, all that advice this witness to yes. do is speculate about what's in the mind of yes. others. Yes, I'm happy to put it that way. So, by your presence, you intended that um, sorry, I just lost my, my train of thought. Um, <coughs> yes, that by your presence in the special executive meeting, you intended that the special executive, sorry, that the executive would act contrary to the position at national conference that pedophiles not be restored to ministry. Is that a question? Yes. I reject it completely. At that meeting, I was extremely emotional. I was in the room. I was a basket case. I don't believe that I had any real active, um, you know, control or any active even uh, voice in those decisions. Now, you'd agree that um, you certainly had a conflict of interest when you attended that meeting on the 22nd of December, don't you? I agree that I felt conflicted on the inside. I'm not sure that's the same thing as a conflict of well, interest. Well, I'll take that as a no, then. You did not understand that there was a conflict between your interests as the son of a perpetrator and your interest as the national president of the Assemblies of God. Is that the, correct? I would say at the time I did not see that as a conflict of interest. And nobody else... In the at, spirit of the relationships And nobody else at the... Me sorry, I'll withdraw that. There was some acknowledgement of your conflict in the sense that you stepped down as chair so that John Lewis could take the meeting. That's correct, isn't it? I think it was suggested to me that I step down from the chair. All right. And rather than my volunteer in it. In your, in your understanding, then, that was because of your conflict of interest as the son of Frank Houston. And because of my extreme trauma at the, at the time. Yes. Now, we know from the, from the minutes that there was a process to be adopted after that, namely that you were to then go back and report the decision of the executive to Frank Houston. Yes. And you were also to go back to AHA and explain the process of discipline and restoration yes. that, that had been followed. Yes. All right. So do I take it then that not only had you spoken, sorry, withdraw that, not only had you spoken with your father, Frank Houston, and heard his confession prior to the meeting, yes. <coughs> but you had reported to the meeting about those matters, yes. and that you had then, at the end of the process, assumed a responsibility for speaking further with Frank Houston and with the complainant about what steps were to be taken. I think that was the recommendation of the meeting. And you would agree that you had a conflict of interest throughout 
that period from when Frank Houston first admitted the allegations to you all the way through to the steps that you were required to undertake as a result of the decision on the 22nd of December 1999. Sorry? Would you agree that you had a... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll phrase it, I have to expand that a little bit, but in any event, you had a conflict of interest from the time at which you started... You spoke to Frank Houston right. about the allegations where you heard his confession from that point in time all the way through to the special executive meeting on the 22nd of December 1999, and that that continued on with the steps that are set out in the minutes, namely speaking again to your father and speaking to the complainant. Would you agree with that? It's not the way I saw it at the time. Yes, but do you agree now that that's the position? In hindsight, I think it would possibly have been... Well, I mean, I did get someone else... You know, someone else did chair the meeting and, um, and the next meeting that we had. Um, it, was the, it was the wishes of the meeting for the, these points to be pursued. I did feel a sense of responsibility uh, as National Superintendent to man up and face this, and especially because it was my own father. So I don't necessarily agree with you. All right. Well, you'd agree that there was a conflict of interest up until the meeting at uh, Sydney Airport on the 22nd of December. Do you agree with that? No, I agree that I was feeling conflicted. It's, I'm talking about emotions. All right. You don't agree that there was a conflict between your position as the father of the perpetrator and the national president of the AOG? It's not the way I saw it. Now, we understand that there was <coughs> to be no publication of the fact of the suspension of your father's credential as a result of the 22nd of December 1999 meeting. Mm -hmm. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Can we point to it right here? And there was no, there was no announcement to even... Sorry, I'll withdraw that. There was no announcement to anyone other than other executives of the Assemblies of God as a result of this meeting of the 22nd of December 1999. I'm not sure that's completely true. Well, what do you recall as to the publication? I think this was a starting point. Yes. So it started there. I do think that we did, you know, take time to, to relate to various state executive presidents and so on. Uh, from this moment on, I definitely did start talking with the New Life of Our Church, starting with going to visit, well, actually before this, I went literally to the workplace of every one of the elders of the church by car and told them the story. So I remember being what, did you, what did you tell them? Just the exact story. That this, this person had come to me and this is what he had said, and how they'd contacted George, and uh, just told them the entire story. Up to that point. So I'm just going to find a particular document. Yeah, so I'll just show you paragraph 35 of your statement about that. Sure.
see in the second paragraph there, which is part of 35. Yes. I made various announcements across the 12-month period after November 1999 to the board staff, to our leaders and at various public church services across our Norwest and Sydney City campuses. I don't know about the exact dates. But you say, but the recurring theme was that there were victims, people were damaged, and on most occasions that it involved minors. Do you see that? Yes. All right. Um, now, you don't mention there that you were informing people of um, that it was your father, do you? No, but it definitely was what it was about. It, what did you... It may have been what it was about. Is what did you say during those oh, I see. announcements? No, no I, every, time, every single time I, I mentioned it was my father. All right. Now, there was no public announcement um, of the allegations against your father was there at, uh, in 99 or in 2000? I believe there was. And that was in the, these sermons, was, was it? it? Was that in these sermons? In my were, sermons? Yes, that you referred uh, to at 35. There was one or two that perhaps were in a sermon, but there were other times when I literally got the church members and told them specifically um, that there had been a, a serious uh, accusation against Frank, that it had been proved correct. Uh, I can't tell you exact wording, but... Uh, usually along the lines that people were badly hurt um, and that uh, I can't say I said it on every occasion but more often than not that it included minors, people who were underage. And what about minors? Pardon? Serious <coughs> accusations involving minors? Sexual accusations involving minors, yes. Is that what you said, sexual allegations? Well, as I say, there were different meetings at different times. Our church even then had many services so you couldn't talk to people all at once so the various times I spoke the wording wouldn't have been exactly the, time, the same and it's possible that um, the weakest of those I might have said the words um, moral failure but mostly I was very deliberate about making sure that people knew that people's lives had been seriously injured and hurt that these were, were um, extremely serious offences and that uh, it, it involved minors. Um, later in 2000, and, and you received some further allegations about your father from New Zealand. Is that yes, right? Yes, yes. Now, you reported on the 22nd of November to a further special executive meeting... Yes. ...about those allegations. Is that yes, right? Yes. And how had you come to be aware of those allegations? Literally a phone call from New Zealand from someone in the national... New Zealand Assemblies of God. Do you recall when that um, phone call happened? Well, just before this period that we're talking about, sometime immediately before. Before November of 2000? Yes. It was around 12 months after the initial... All right. Did, did the, did the rumours or allegations dribble in, or was it uh, one particular phone call, or how did it come to you? It started with literally a phone call from Wayne Hughes, who was the General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God in New Zealand, and it was along the lines that such and such a person is going to be in Sydney and would like to catch up with you for a coffee and you need to talk to him. I had absolutely no doubt that this whole thing was about to get worse. All right. And so you had the meeting with um, a new complainant, is that yes, right? Yes, And he revealed to you that um, he or she had been uh, he. sexually abused by your father. Yeah, he told me his story. And... 30 or so years ago, is that right? Yes. He said it was when he was 14. He may have even told me it happened in my house, in my home, keeping in mind I was also about 14 at that time. And, and yeah. All right. And what did you find out about um, how his complaint had been dealt with by the New Zealand Assemblies of God? I'm not sure at all, actually, whether he even uh, officially reported it to the New Zealand Assemblies of God. They were obviously aware of him. I would guess, and I think it's an educated guess, that he didn't want to pursue it again. He just wanted to be heard. He wanted me to know. And there were one or two or three other things that he asked me to do for him. Did you offer him uh, any assistance with dealing with uh, the subject matter of the complaint?
question, the um, what assistance, if any, did you offer uh, this complainant who had come from New Zealand? From, me from memory, he told me his whole story. There was a warm conversation. Um, he ex did explain to me that the reason he was a psychologist was because of those abuses. He had, like everyone else, he had obviously been grievously damaged by uh, my father's offences. And he talked to me about three specific things. I hope I can remember all three. One of them was uh, that he get assistance to travel to America to attend a conference. A second one was that he speak to all the pastors at our church uh, about abuse, which I considered seriously. And the third one, <coughs> at this very point, I can't remember it, maybe here in documentation somewhere. What did you agree to? Uh, um, well, I took it back to the elders of the church and uh, the board and the elders, and we discussed it, and we really basically pointed them towards the New Zealand Assemblies of God and the Lower Hutt Assemblies of God. You didn't think there was a role for, for Hillsong here in Australia, particularly given that um, the, the uh, perpetrator was uh, your father? Um, when these things happened, Hillsong didn't exist at all. It was long before Hillsong existed. So in that sense, I do not feel and did not feel that we have any legal responsibility. We could debate a moral responsibility, but uh, I feel like the recourse for things that happen in New Zealand is in New Zealand. Certainly in terms of uh, a legal obligation to do so, but one of the, one of the matters that um, has arisen a number of times in the Royal Commission is to whether people have a moral responsibility to look after um, people who have come forward many, many years, sometimes decades later, to complain of abuse by a pastor of or a minister of a church um, to which the, the complaint is received. Do you, do you understand that, first of all? Yeah. Am I able to use an analogy, a metaphor? Or? Well, can I ask you, maybe I should ask you this way. Um, you didn't see any degree of moral responsibility placed upon you as Hills Christian Life Centre or Hillsong Church to assist this complainant even though your father had preached for Hills Christian Life Centre and for Sydney Christian Life Centre. He also preached for before. many, many other people. Indeed. But he was the senior pastor at Sydney, was he not? Yes, he was. And um, he also preached at Hillsong having and had a, an office of some description there? Yes. Yes. At Hillsong? At Hillsong. No. Um, did you not feel that there was some obligation upon you, moral obligation, to assist this man, notwithstanding that the events had occurred in New Zealand? I've got to just keep reminding myself that I'm my father's son but I, I am not guilty of any of these offences. And so it's very easy for me to go into self-condemnation and start taking it upon myself. And I feel like, uh, as a 15, 14-year-old boy myself, that I don't have any responsibility. And so to me, there's a blurred line sometimes between my responsibility as Frank's son and my responsibility of a church that didn't even exist when these things happened. And... Uh, I, uh, I think it's a debate. I think it's a question worth asking. And we're a compassionate church, I feel. And to be honest, what he was asking for wasn't going to cost a bundle of money. It's not as though it was going to you know, be a matter of you know, extreme pain for the church. I think more we just felt that he's a New Zealander. He still lives in New Zealand. It happened in New Zealand. There's a New Zealand Assemblies of God. There's a New Zealand Lower Hutt Assemblies of God where my father was the pastor. And the best place for him to go and ask these questions was there. All right. Now, you know that as a result of the special executive meeting on the 22nd of November that um, pastors Lewis and Ainge went to New Zealand to meet with the executive there? <coughs> yes, yes. Um, and I know you weren't, as I understand it, I was, out of, meeting, I was out of the loop at that out point. Out of the loop. Yeah. But you knew that that had taken place. Yes, and um, that they and that they then returned and reported to yes. the executive. That's right, isn't it? Um, now, 
when they got to New Zealand, they discovered, and this is what Pastor Ainge told us today and is in his report, that up to 50 New Zealand pastors were aware of allegations against your father sure. in New Zealand. Sure. You're aware of that? Yes. And that those um, allegations had been around for about three years at that stage? We, uh, you're aware of that now, yes. aren't you? Yes. <coughs> Is it the case? Well, sorry, I withdraw that. Is it really the case that you heard no rumours at all about your father's conduct? Any inkling of my father being a paedophile? And after after you'd received those allegations from AHA, did you make any? inquiries with the New Zealand AOG about whether there were any allegations in New Zealand at about the same time as AHA's allegation? I probably didn't. I probably didn't, but I've just got to get my sequence of events right because, um, you know, obviously the first thing I ever heard was AHA. And then 12 months later was when I got a specific phone call from someone who wanted to talk to me. In that period there, I may have started hearing a few whispers. In terms of the 50 people on the boat, I think that was pretty well right around the same time as when we did actually hear. I don't think it was like a long time before. And so, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was becoming clear very quickly, this is a very big problem. And was it your idea to send somebody to, uh, to New Zealand to find out what the, um, the extent of the allegations was? Well, I wasn't in the room when those decisions were made. I know that. Was it your idea, though? No. But I was very happy with it. Because by then, we just wanted to get to the bottom of it. <coughs> now, there was a meeting about a week after the special executive meeting of um, the special elders at Hillsong Church. Right. I'll have that brought up for you. Tender, tender bundle eight. You're aware of this meeting, I presume? Uh, I just get to read it. Uh, can we go up a little? Uh, you mean scroll down the page? Yes. Yes. I see that that's a, that's a meeting at which you, um, you're listed as present at the top there. Uh -huh. um, and uh, you chaired that meeting, did you? Uh, you know, this meeting I obviously happened. I, right at this moment, don't remember too much about it. I, I accept every single thing that's written there. All right. Um, so at that meeting, um, Frank Houston's resignation was tabled? Again. You to me, it seems like over this period there was, written, there was all sorts of resignations. Well, well, we're just dealing with Frank Houston's at the moment. No, I mean Frank Houston. Where I note that it's got the name of a victim in it. Yes, thank you. I have uh, to make sure redacted. that that's thank redacted. You. Thanks, Mr Higgins. Um, I can show you a hard copy if, uh, sure. if, if you need to. It'll just be handed up by Ms. Sure. McNair now.
Yes, we just handed you a hard copy of the, the minutes of the special elders meeting. Um, so, um, Frank tendered his resignation at that stage. That's right, isn't it? Yep, I think he did that quite a few times. Um, and then there was a discussion about a retirement package. Yes. Um, and that, that was a reference to some form of financial support to be given to him and um, his wife. Yes. Um, after the resignation, is that right? Yes. Uh, so do I take it that um, it's reasonable to assume that as a result of the allegations from AHA <coughs> coming to light, that, um, first of all, he lost his ability to minister yes. any further, lost his credential yes. as an AOG minister, yes. um, that um, he resigned from Hillsong Church? Yes. Well, he was asked to leave Hillsong Church, technically. All right, but it's recorded here as a as a resignation. Sure. And um, he was then given financial support in his retirement um, away from Hillsong Church. Is that right? Yeah, both he and my mother. A lot of the a lot of the consideration of our executive then was towards my mother, who was a victim of this herself, and who had also given her whole life to working for the church. And I think our board and elders really, really felt like um, they wanted to look after her. And obviously they lived together. So. And then it was to be, uh, you say, announcement to churches, or well, that is the minutes record, it was agreed that a simple announcement concerning Frank's retirement would be sufficient at this stage. Do you see that? Yes. So I take it that the uh, extent of the announcement was simply that, that he had retired, without explaining anything about the allegations of child sexual abuse? I think the allegations of child sexual abuse were well known by this time in our church. I think that what this was saying is, look, this is just finalising it. He hadn't been in his office in, in Oxford Street, where he was, for at least a year. He had already been told to go to Inwards, the supervising state executive's services during the course of 2000. He, this is really just all about finally just finalising, let's get his things out of his office. Let's, um, he, he was moving up to the central coast. Let's just um, uh, let the church know that he won't be around anymore. All right, well, look, just on that issue of publication, I'll take you to a further document, Tender Bundle 10. Sure. This is a letter from the General Secretary of the Assemblies of God in New Zealand, Neil Hetrick, H-E-T-R-I-C-K, yes. to you dated the 9th of May 2001. Do you know the letter? Can't remember it. I'll read it quickly. What was the date on this one? 9th of May 2001. 2001. <laughs> Uh, I see. Not to me, two thousand and one. Okay, I'll bring it. All right, and I've just scrolled down so. Um, can read the handwriting there. Yes. And um, that's your handwriting, isn't it? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Um, I'll do my best, but uh, perhaps you should read it out for the Royal Commission. I'm not good at reading my own handwriting. Um, thanks for letter. Apologise for late reply. I had a good talk with Dennis Humphreys and Ken Harrison. They're both New Zealand pastors. I was in Auckland in April. At this point, we're not planning to make any public announcement over here. Uh, thank you to the New Zealand Executive for your wisdom in uh, such and such a difficult and sensitive matter. Handling such a difficult and sensitive matter? Pardon? Handling, is that what it says? Yeah, I think so. 
Yes. All right. So um, the New Zealand executive had written to you concerning any possible public announcement, hadn't they? I think this is talking about two other pastors all over Australia and all over New Zealand. Well, it says, public announcement you may have to make now or in the future concerning your father to your church or the Australian Fellowship. Sorry, I'll just scroll down so you can see that. It's the first paragraph, or the second paragraph, I should say, of that. Do you see that? Uh, they have assumed that this becomes necessary that you would inform us. Any the, decisions? The paragraph before that. Sorry. Executive Westbury <coughs> asked, I write to you concerning any possible public announcement you may make. You may have to make now, in or in the future, concerning your father yes. to your church, okay? Yes. Or the Australian Fellowship. And you, you knew that when um, Pastors Lewis and Ainge returned from New Zealand, that they drafted a statement concerning your father. Uh -huh. Sorry, is that a yes? Mm, yes. Thank you. Um, and that the agreement between the two executives, that is the Australian and New Zealand executives, was to make it to agree on what statement would be publicly released. Yes. To pastors. And to pastors. And there we see at uh, on the 9th of May, um, there's reference to making such a public announcement, isn't there? In that first paragraph, there's... You've asked me a question? Sorry. Yes. 9th of May? Yes. So there's mention in that meeting of making this, a public announcement about your father. Isn't that right? I'm not following, sorry. Well, there's mention in the, in the, in the letter of the 9th of May 2001 that... Um, sorry, I'll withdraw that. There's a question posed by Mr Hetrick as to whether you will make a statement um, about your father to your church or the Australian Fellowship. Do you see that? Yep. And you replied that was, there was no proposal to make such a public announcement over in Australia. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Sorry, we've only got a... Mm, is that a yes? I'm That's sorry a, yeah, for the transcript. Yes, sorry. All right. Um, and then I'll show you another document. Um, it's tab... 11 of the tender bundle, 24th of December 2001. When was that last date, sorry, that we just looked at now? 9th of May 2001. 2001. And right. now this is the 24th of December 2001. Okay. And you'll see that it's a letter that concerns two pastors, but the one regarding Frank has been made clear. If we just scroll down... This was a letter that was addressed to you, but also to all ordained and probationary ministers of the Assemblies of God in Australia. I remember this letter. All right. And if we go over to the second page, we'll see that the statement that had been drafted by Pastors Lewis and Ainge mm -hmm. is included there. Yes. Um, where the reference is made to a serious moral failure. Yes. But not to child sexual abuse. No, and I think we all would agree that it was a poor choice of words. Um, do I take it that the first time the Assemblies of God actually wrote to ordained and probationary ministers of the Assemblies of God to inform them of Frank Houston's conduct towards children, namely sexual abuse, was the 24th of December 2001? Possibly, possibly as a blanket statement to the entire nation. Uh, yes, but before that, I feel like, uh, <coughs> again, state superintendents, other people, uh, that, you know, churches that were close to Hillsong, <coughs> churches which were likely to have Frank preach, all of those things, had were already in the loop. In other words, this isn't a complete shock to people by now. Why was it... Sorry, I withdraw that. You'd had the meeting of the special executive back in November of 2000, at which determination had been made that if the new New Zealand allegations were accepted, yes. then he was not to preach ever again. Yes. And then he resigned shortly after it. Yes. Why wasn't that letter released at about that time, namely at, right at the end of 2000? I don't have a reason. Why did it, why did it have to take 12 months before... 
the Assemblies of God got around to actually informing its ordained and probationary ministers? I, I think the only, the only thing I could say is that there was always a process to this. There was always, I think, you know, in a lot of things, you can, you can go too slow, but you can also go too fast. And I think we were trying to keep sensitive to all of the various parties involved, uh, including victims. Uh, and it just followed a course to this point. doesn't seem to explain why there was a 12 month delay. Well, at this point, keep in mind from an Assemblies of God perspective, <coughs> I was not directly involved in the decision being made for Frank, about Frank. At the end of that letter, and if you just scroll down a bit for, to the next paragraph that we can't see, you'll see that. Um, Pastor Lewis says, we have deliberately chosen to restrict this letter to our ordained and probationary ministers. We cannot see any reason for this to be announced to your church or further afield. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So there was... A, sorry, you'll have to say uh, yes or no. Sorry, I keep forgetting. I it's, it's a yes, sir. Um, it was... So we've seen, we see that that uh, was deliberately restricted to ordained and probationary ministers and not to be disseminated in the church or further afield. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. um, was any consideration given by you as the national president at the time to advising churches, particularly those who had attended a church who may have at some stage been sexually abused by Frank Houston. You're saying, should we have put a broader uh, communication out there? What, well, perhaps I'll, I'll take it one step at a yeah. time. You'd, you'd understand that there, um, there may have been other people out there in Assemblies of God children, churches who had been abused by your father... In Australia. In Australia, some years before. Sure. You I don't know. You said that any. that was a possibility. I don't know of any. Yes. All right. Um, but in any event, it was a possibility, was it not? It's a possibility, yes. Um, and that if you were to make, if the Assemblies of God were to make a public statement, that there was some possibility that those people might come forward to say that they too had been abused. Right. Would you accept that that was uh, certainly a possibility? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And it says, we cannot see any reason for this to be announced to your church or further afield. So I simply ask you, was it considered that there may have been victims of your father out there who may have wanted to come forward if they knew that the issue was being... Uh, discussed or dealt with at um, the National Executive of the Assemblies of God? I can say that had nothing to do with the motivation of the letter. Right. But no consideration was given to that fact, is that right, as far as you know? Well, you'd possibly have to ask a broader group of people who were on that executive, but from my perspective, yes. that was not in our, in our minds and our consideration at all. Um, the final thing I, I wanted to ask you about was uh, uh, there's a pseudonym list in front of you. I want to ask you about at the top of the page there, you'll see the second pseudonym is AHG. There's a laminated sheet there you'll see that I think depending on which side you're looking at. Okay. Yes, it's the second name from the top. Yes. And the name we use the pseudonym that the Royal Commission has appointed.
appointed him is AHG. Yeah, this is a person who was abused in New Zealand. Yes, um, and um, there was... You came to know that he'd been abused in New Zealand um, after, I think, the uh, resignation of your father. Is that right? Yes, yes. And Well after, I think. And but prior to your father passing away? Um, yeah, I think so. And um, he was, AHG, was at that stage living in Sydney? Was he? I don't know. I Did thought, you know that he was living in Australia? Yeah, I knew he was in Australia. I don't know where in Australia he lived. All right. Um, now, um, AHG has... has um, in, informed the Royal Commission that he went through a process with the New Zealand um, Assemblies of God, yes. which resulted in a, a financial settlement yes. um, with respect to sexual abuse that your father had yes. uh, perpetrated on him. You're aware of that? Yes. And um, did, did you, your father, or Hillsong Church contribute to that settlement? No. Did the Australian Assemblies of God contribute to that settlement? No. All right. Do you recall receiving a request from the New Zealand Assemblies of God for some assistance of AHG? Yes. And what was the nature of the request? I probably couldn't tell you exactly what they were asking for. We saw it purely as being their responsibility and put it back there. All right. Did you offer for example, to have a meeting between AHG and your father about those um, allegations? Um, AHG, this particular person, and the people who were supporting him, was very, uh, very aggressive. Are you he, he referring to his lawyers when um, you say the people that were supporting no, him? No, I'm talking about a well-known um, mischief maker, if you like, uh, when it comes to the Assemblies of God overall, who, who put his weight behind this guy. And that made it very difficult. Um, he never, that I can recall, made any personal contact with me, any personal contact with Hillsong Church, any personal contact with the Australian Assemblies of God. OK, what I'm asking you about is whether um, you assisted the New Zealand Assemblies of God to resolve issues, for example, around his allegations about what occurred with him in New Zealand? The answer is no. All right. Did you take... Were you requested to assist with the resolution of those allegations for the New, Ze New Zealand Assemblies of God? I think that there was a, a request from New Zealand or a suggestion that perhaps we should, but we didn't feel that it was appropriate. Did you consider that there were, that it was um, appropriate for you or Frank Houston to meet with AHG to assist him in his in the resolution of his complaint? Can you tell me the date that this was, or the, or well, the year in between um, two thousand and two thousand and four? So my father died in two thousand and four. Yes, and. From the time that from the time that these first exposures came out late 1999 Yes, please continue. From the time these exposures started coming out in late 1999 to 2004, I think probably because of the stress and the pain of all of this and the humiliation, my father deteriorated very quick into dementia. So month by month, year by year, he got worse. So I would say that by this time, my father was too sick to have that kind of meeting. All right. Would, uh, was it ever expressed to you by the New Zealand Assemblies of God that... Um AHG would have preferred to receive compensation and an apology directly from both you and your father? I take no responsibility for that whatsoever. I know, but was that ever expressed to you? No. Um, are you aware of contact between the New Zealand Assemblies of God and your father about AHG? My brother was handling my father's business and dealings by then because 
of my, you know, obvious conflict, if you like, with um, being a pastor at Hillsong Church and so on. So my brother and him were in contact. I've seen, I've seen a, a, an email, a letter. Do I take it by what you've just said that that um, you reached a position that you thought you had a conflict of interest and so therefore you didn't want any further involvement um, in dealing with allegations against your father by that stage? Yeah, I also think we're straying away from the parameters of this commission because we're talking about me now as a son, not as a pastor. Well, I'm talking about, I am talking about your position as the national president of the Assemblies of God and that you had a conflict of interest with being the son of a perpetrator. Sorry, I missed the last part. So the conflict of interest I'm talking about is between yes. your position as the national president of the Assemblies of God yes. and your position as the father of a perpetrator. Yeah, clearly. Clearly I was wearing two hats. Sorry, I can't hear that. Clearly I was wearing two hats. Yes, all right. And you recognise by the time that your brother took over that you had such a conflict, is that right? My brother took over immediately after AHA and when it it's became just, clear there were more people involved. All right, but um, you recognised at that stage that you had such a conflict, didn't you? Well, apart from anything else, I was conflicted. I was traumatised. I ended up myself through all of this and I'm not saying my pain's anything close to someone who's been victimised by a paedophile. But I ended up myself uh, in this whole situation being diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. So just returning to AHG, <coughs> did you take any steps, first of all, to uh, provide a pol an apology yourself or yeah. from your father for Please. him? May I object to this? The role of... Brian Houston um, in the AHG allegation as an issue for this inquiry to determine could only be confined to the extent that it informs us about any realisation he has about the existence of a conflict of interest. Outside of that, it does not assist, I would respectfully submit, this inquiry within its terms of reference. This witness has said on a number of occasions that whilst he felt personally conflicted, he does not adopt the proposition from counsel assisting that he had a conflict of interest, as is being suggested. To invite further evidence now from this witness um, can only go beyond the point that it will assist this inquiry. They're my respectful submissions. Issue. The issue that um, I'm attempting to um, question this witness about is not so much the issue of conflict of interest, although it arose in that last uh, passage of evidence, but more, in fact, the, uh, the degree to which Pastor Brian Houston and his father engaged with a complainant, somebody who had been abused by Frank Houston in New Zealand, but who was living in Australia. So it's about that particular issue, not so much the conflict. But that's not an institutional response. Well, we're, this is the President of the Assemblies of God and it related to um, a pastor who had been ministering for the Assemblies of God prior to... Um, uh, prior to his resignation. So I understand the state of Pastor Houston's evidence at this stage is <coughs> that um, he uh, didn't give um, he any didn't feel any yes. obligation yes. Um, or sense of responsibility towards yeah. AHG. This is you, yeah, um, yeah. Mr. Houston. To be honest, uh, um, no, I didn't. I felt like his his recourse was the New Zealand Assemblies of God. That was the right place for him to go. It happened in New Zealand. Yes, he was a resident in Australia now. My brother looked after him from a family perspective and uh, 
you know, again, you can talk about legal responsibility, moral. Do, do I feel sad that here's someone else that my father has grievously hurt? Of course I do. Um, but I do feel like it's very easy to slip into somehow making me, you know, the responsible for my father's sins, and that's what I won't accept. And indeed, the, uh, the, the questions that have been put to you with respect to the difficulty, um, that is, the, the, the conflict sure. of interest in, a, um, in an objective legal sense, yeah. um, highlights exactly what you're saying, doesn't it? It does, I think, yes. And what I understand you to be telling the Commission is, um, despite you not realising at the beginning that objective conflict that you were in, yes. at the point at, is this correct, that at the point at which AHG makes an approach to you, yes. it crystallises for you. Is that, yeah. is that a fair assessment? It does. And that you then give that responsibility to your brother to take over that... that yeah. My brother took it on because of that very reason, that's true. And my brother's not in the church at all. He's not been in the church since he's a teenager. And it was felt best that when it comes to my father's personal issues, any complaints against Frank personally, any correspondent that my brother would, would take care of that. All right. So um, do you... I, I, I'm, I'm not clear about this at this yes. stage. Do you offer... Uh, what is it that you offer... AHG upon his approach to you? He never approached me. So you, you learn of his complaint? I was aware of his complaint, but his, his whole focus was on New Zealand. So the New Zealand Assembly, as a God at one point, wrote, from my memory, someone may be able to correct me, from, from my memory, contacted our secretary with a suggestion, maybe you guys should help us on this. Yes. And we together agreed, the executive agreed, that this was a New Zealand issue. It happened in New Zealand before Frank ever passed it in Australia. And uh, the, guy, the guy had moved to Australia as an adult now, okay. but we just believed it was a New Zealand issue. All right. The, the help that was being sought, was it help um, of a spiritual or pastoral kind or help of a, for counselling or um, a, a monetary compensation package or any, any well, or that, all of Well, as I say, I never heard directly from him at any level. I said, Mr. God, Hillsong, me personally, I never heard from him directly. My feeling, really, it was all about uh, vindication and compensation. But did you, did you take any action to understand what help was being sought? I was... I was close enough in contact with the New Zealanders to be aware of what was happening. But I genuinely believed that that was where his recourse was, that he's, he's pointing to the right people if he's talking to New Zealand. Did you, did you appreciate he was living in Australia? He had moved to Australia now as an yeah. adult, yes. But don't forget, when this happened to him in New Zealand, I was a teenager... Hillsong Church didn't um, exist. Clear, clear about that. Hill CFC didn't exist. But, Sorry. for example, if this individual was seeking some sort of pastoral assistance no, there was from no, the church... There was, no, there was no, no request to us for that at all. And what did complicate it, I would say, again, with this particular individual, is that he did... Um, he did br bring on board a... Uh, a very difficult person, an abrasive, difficult person who had agendas far bigger than this AHG's um, sexual abuse, and that did complicate things as well. Because that person wasn't there for, in my, in my humble opinion, wasn't there for AHG, he was there to cause mischief. Mr Beckett. Uh, Your Honour, I'm conscious of the time. I've, I have essentially finished uh, my questions for... Pastor Houston, I wonder if I could have the indulgence of continuing tomorrow if I, if there's something that I've forgotten okay. while I review it this afternoon. I've also spoken briefly with, um, well, at least received a message from Ms McGlinchey and Mr Koenigan that they will require together about an hour with, with uh, Pastor Houston, and I imagine uh, that uh, Mr Higgins and Mr Chowdhury will similarly have some questions for him. All right. So that indication having been 
given Pastor Houston, you'll ob obviously be required to return uh, to the Commission tomorrow. And I'm, I, I'm not sure if you heard that indication that Mr Beckett gave with respect yes. to um, the possible uh, time that you'll be required further. Um, 10 a.m. in the morning. Thank you. I'll be here. <laughs> Thanks. All stand.